like to welcome everyone in this important and urgent event, Planetary Health. It's time to act. So everything is connected. All of the areas of the human activities and the planet are connected. Achieving a planetary health will demand a great transition. We should all learn to do virtually everything in a different fashion. We need to set goals and we need to have common uh, shared future visions. So let me introduce the authorities who are part of the opening session. Without further ado, I pass the floor to the uh, research provost of the University of Sao Paulo, Dr. Silvio Canto. So thank you, Ana. Thank you so much. It's a great satisfaction to be here with you. Uh, we have great panelists in this opening session. I have illustrious and dear people here with me today. So I'm quite happy with this event. And as you said, it's time to act. Well, it's unnecessary, I think, to say, needless to say that we live in the global world and this is our home. So we need to take care of our home. But before emphasizing all of this, let me, uh, you know, thank some people, especially you for conducting this event and participating in the organization and uh, Professor Antonio Moro Sariva. It's a great satisfaction to have you here after a year and a half in which we were both in Stanford to hold the international event of a planetary health to to be held next year in April 2021. So we had here, we're having here this event, which is going to be a very important preliminary event for the great event that is going to happen next year. So we have the support of the Office of Research of the University of Sao Paulo. And quite proudly, I must say, our intent was that the uh, support centers, they are actually research centers related to the uh, research provost dealing with uh, similar topics. This enabled us to discuss these uh, themes in a more comprehensive fashion. So we launched a tendering process to make this happen. And as I speak to you, I'm quite proud, but eventually I would like to congratulate all of you because we've had seven research centers connected to us and seven is an impressive numbers an impressive number. So they joined, they put efforts together to organize this event to make it happen so that we could be discussing all of the aspects that we are going to be discussing here, which is also a preparatory phase for next year's event. So congratulations to all of the organizers on holding this event. I would like to congratulate the panelists and welcome all of the participants as well and say that we are heading towards uh, in a fast pace for an event with a greater impact that will happen next year. So you all have been engaged in the organization in a quite uh, wonderful way. So we have a great deal of responsibility in preserving our planet. After all, we are global. We all live in this very home and we all hold the responsibility of taking care of this planet, not only to ourselves, but to keep it for the future generations. As I said before, it's unbelievable that we have to insist on the topic of the importance of preserving this planet. Well, made this year in a very sharp way, I would say, in a quite imperative way, this year has proven to us that we are all connected. So in pandemic times, this has been um, highly demonstrated. So I think it's a quite relevant topic that we are dealing with here. It's an urgent matter to be discussed so much so that these are my initial words. Congratulations on the initiative. I wish you all an excellent event. And as you know, the uh, provost is deeply involved and will still be involved in organizing this event and the next event next year. It is a relevant project, so we'll always be in tune with this topic. Before concluding, I would like to say two sentences in English to Mr. Sam Myers. Sam Myers here, yeah. and have the opportunity 
to thank him for his continued support, not only this event, but in the Planetary Health Alliance. So thank you very much, Yassan, for your support. Great to see you. And uh, let's have all a great event. Muito obrigado e tenham todos um grande evento. Muito obrigado. Thank you all. Wish you all a fruitful event. Thank you. Now I pass the floor to the uh, director of the Institute of Advanced Studies of the University of the, uh, Sao Paulo, Professor Guilherme Plonsky. Good morning. I greet Professor Canuto, our uh, officer of research, my dear friend as well. I greet Professor Antonio Sarava, who has so many roles. He coordinates NAPI, he presides, he chairs the Commission of Research of the Institute, he coordinates the group of planetary health as well. He is engaged with the uh, provost and so many other roles and functions. I greet once again, uh, Dr. Samuel uh, Myers, honoring us with his presence here. I greet Professor Ana Paula Magalhães, in addition to being engaged in the planetary health group, she's also engaged in the uh, provost. She coordinates a very important research group in the Institute of Advanced Studies focused on intercultural dialogues. And I greet all of the panelists and attendees who are participating in this effort. And I would like to highlight three brief aspects. First, something that was uh, mentioned by Professor Canuto, that is the word alliance. The challenge of planetary health, not only do we have to insist on that theme, but we need to find ways to promote governance and coordination. And this alliance mechanism has proven to be promising, not only in this international alliance on the planetary health, but also setting the examples inside the house, as Professor Canuto said, establishing an alliance amongst the many research centers. The Institute of the Advanced Studies, the uh, provost office, establishing alliances within the university as well, so that we may truly achieve a response as big as the challenge. So the second aspect that I would like to address is about the event in itself. Recently, we had uh, the Lancet publication with the name Countdown. And the title of today's event and tomorrow's event brings together, once again, space and time. The uh, topic of health, the topic of the environment, they are interconnected and they have the uh, dimension of the planet. It's not possible to address them isolatedly. But on the other hand, we do have the specificities of Latin America. It's a quite complex uh, name per se. There are parts that are not called Latin America, but they have their language arising from Latin as is part of Canada, for example. Well, I'm not discussing the political history as the core topic here. So Latin America, not always uh, does it emerge as a possible alliance to handle, to deal with the issues that are quite specific for the global perspectives. So we have the uh, space dimension to be addressed and the time dimension to be addressed. Time is now, time to act is now as the name of the event says. As has been widely shown in the case of the pandemic, in the case of the uh, COVID, if things happen in a fast pace, in a few weeks actually, the world transformed in a remarkable fashion. The historical time was quite short, one and a half to two years. So this week, we are beginning with the vaccination process. So most likely there'll be a reasonable uh, reversion of the scenario so that we can go back to the normal situation, normal conditions. 
I'm not sure whether we are going to go back to the same levels that we had before. But as far as, far as climate goes, the uh, transformation to a worsened scenario is much slow and it's virtually impossible to reverse, virtually infeasible to reverse after the tipping points. Therefore, what we are doing here is crucially important for the future. Well, it's a future in which we ourselves perhaps will not be here. I would like to remind you that 2021, this is a, when we begin the decade of the UN for the regeneration of the systems. So time-wise, this event is quite timely as well. And therefore I conclude with this uh, message that addresses this uh, courageous uh, period in which Saraiva and his team decided to hold this event that is halfway through December as we are now. So we are, you know, close to important periods based in the Western culture because of the Christian uh, ceremonies so in the Christian culture, we are close to Christmas and this entails birth, hope. And in the Jewish culture, we are in the middle of the Hanukkah celebration that is the celebration of light, illumination. So we hope that these are two days are days of a contribution for a rebirth, the regeneration of the planet as the UN says, focused on Latin America so that the conversations and the dialogues that take place here and the papers that will be presented by the students shed light to our path. I wish you all a happy event and a great year to all of us. Now I give the floor to Professor Samuel Myers from Harvard University Center for Development and Director of the Planet and Health Online. All right, well, thank you so much. I apologize that I don't speak Portuguese. I'm humbled by how many of you are all bilingual and I'm noticing that it's a really great way to start a conference to have to listen to a language that you don't understand because it reminds you of how much you don't know. So thank you for this humbling experience and um, it's lovely to be with you and so exciting uh, what all of you are doing. Um, the core premise, as you, as you know, of planetary health is that uh, the scale of all of our human activities collectively is now exceeding our planet's capacities to absorb our waste or to provide the resources that we're using sustainably. And as a result, our activities are really fundamentally transforming all of our planet's natural systems, the climate system, driving the sixth mass extinction of life on earth, changing land use and land cover, scarcity of water and arable land, pollution of air, water and soil, changes in biogeochemical cycles. So all of these large scale uh, planetary scale changes are interacting with each other to affect the core conditions for human health and well being. It's pretty clear that our house is on fire, right? That our natural systems are really starting to crumble under the weight of uh, the human enterprise, and that our health uh, is suffering as a result, in particular, the health of our children and their children of all future generations, uh, the health of the poorest people in the world and indigenous communities, but all of our health uh, is at risk. And that we need fundamentally uh, to change course. We need to live differently uh, on earth. And that means changing most of the things that we do or how we do them. So how we produce our food and manufactured goods, how we design our cities to maximize our, our physical and our mental health, but to minimize our ecological footprint. We need to clearly change our energy system and move to a post-combustion energy economy. We need changes in economic theory and accounting, and we need new stories to tell ourselves about our place in the world and our relationship to nature. And 
all of those kinds of changes in how we live on earth, when we bring them together, we call the great transition. Uh, and so the theme of the next planetary health meeting that you all are hosting at University of Sao Paulo is about bridging communities to achieve that great transition. And it's been incredibly uh, rewarding and exciting to work with Dr. Saiva and the whole team on uh, putting that meeting together. We're so um, excited to be doing that. But that theme of bringing communities together, I think is very relevant today. So we're enormously excited to see um, this hub uh, beginning to take shape, this community in uh, Brazil taking shape. I think um, the great transition actually looks a little bit different in different places. You know, what it means to change the way we produce our food or the mix of renewable energies in our energy system or how the circular economy really takes root is going to be different in different places. And so there's a need to contextualize the great transition and to bring the relevant uh, groups together at the regional and national level so that we have uh, government entities and civil society and the NGO sector and the academic world and universities and the private sector coming together to fashion solutions that are relevant in particular parts of the world. And I think that's why this sort of regionalization of planetary health is becoming so important. And what's happening in Brazil is similar to uh, some of the things that are happening in other parts of the world. Although you all are taking uh, real leadership, I think you're a little further ahead than, than some of the other communities, but we're seeing hubs that are popping up uh, in the Caribbean, in East Africa, in West Africa, uh, in Singapore for Southeast Asia. So they're sort of starting to be these, these efforts that are taking root around the world. Uh, there also are communities that are coming together. I see Enrique is on this call, has been very engaged with us in the Clinicians for Planetary Health, which now has over 800 clinicians all around the world that are coming together to think about the role that nurses and physicians and traditional healers and other uh, clinical staff can actually carry the message of planetary health to their patients and serve as messengers. Uh, Nicole de Paula, a Brazilian, has done amazing work creating another community, the Women Leaders uh, in Planetary Health, and that community is growing very rapidly with support of many of you uh, and is also really exciting. We've been curating this next generation researcher community and um, also the Planetary Health uh, Campus Ambassador Group, which uh, has been growing every year. This year, we've just uh, finalized another group of around 70 campus ambassadors, many from Brazil, including I hear Antonio's son, which, <laughs> which is very exciting. Um, so all of these sort of networks around the world of, of the sub communities are sort of the connective tissue that helps bring us together globally. And, and the role of the, the Planetary Health Alliance really is just to kind of try to help hold this, this global community and uh, help stitch together these different efforts across research and education and communication uh, and connect uh, everybody together. Uh, so for example, I was on a call just yesterday where I haven't even had a chance to talk to Antonio about this, but um, we were approached by Klug in Germany, which has developed the Planetary Health Academy in a very, very successful lecture series that's bringing around 1200 people to a lecture every for each lecture from around 72 different countries. Um, and they wanted to team up with the Planetary Health Alliance to create- E eles quiseram se unir às pessoas, às alianças para seguir um curso com relação à saúde planetária. Vocês, claro, estão no Brasil e você tem um curso fantástico sobre a saúde planetária, que nós tra traduzimos para o inglês. Já tivemos mais de 100 pessoas uh, envolvidas nisso. E como estávamos falando ontem, isso está trazendo um grupo brasileiro, um grupo alemão, todas essas pessoas para a gente oferecer esse curso, essa, essa parte educacional sobre a saúde planetária. E também temos uma tecnologia 
uma plataforma de tecnologia para discutir o que estamos falando e o que estamos abordando no curso. Temos um jornal, temos pessoas na Nigéria falando com sobre artigos relacionados uh, sobre uma aula que eles assistiram. Então, a integração de todas essas comunidades e a forma como isso está se expandindo é muito positivo para a saúde planetária. Nós estamos muito empolgados uh, com essas inovações, com, com as fronteiras que vocês estão quebrando com essa conferência hoje. E ter a oportunidade de fazermos nós e o Brasil isso juntos. Então, eu estou muito feliz de poder participar aqui com vocês nesse momento. Muito obrigada por me permitirem estar aqui. Thank you very much, Professor Samuel Myers. Eu passo por fim a palavra para o coordenador do Grupo Saúde Planetária, Professor Antônio Mauro Sarai. É, bom dia a todas e a todos. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Professor Silvio Canuto, Professor Plonsky, dear Sam, Sam Myers, Professor Anna, thank you for your introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here to open this seminar for the planetary health in Latin America. I believe, like uh, it has been already said, it's a very fruitful event. I think it's a very important moment to have an event like that because we're, we're feeling these problems in our bones. So planetary uh, health interferes in the effects that the planetary health has in our health. So COVID-19 is a problem related to planetary health. Climate changes is related to planetary health. But if we have problems, we need to face them with solutions. And this is what we're going to try to find in these two days. So based on the words from Samuel Myers and Adi, alliance is key. So we have to work together. So talking about our seminar, on the first day, we will have four panels, four very interesting panels in subjects uh, such as COVID-19, syndemias. Uh, uh, some people do not know what syndemias means, but we're, we'll learn what it means. We'll have another panel on health, environment and rights and food systems. Uh, divided into two dynamic tables. Uh, tables goes along with uh, food systems. And the fourth panel, which approaches that the earth is blue. Uh, we are going to approach the marine ecosystems and human ecosystems. On the other days, we will have several interesting activities for our future where we are going to talk with researchers and environmental agencies of changes. We're going to have also the launching of the ambassador of planetary health in Brazil, and also the launching of the Brazilian club of health, uh, planetary health studies. And then we're going to approach this topic in a collaborative way. And you are all invited to participate in the workshop of the pl planetary health Latin America, Latin American hub with simultaneous translation into Spanish and English to facilitate communication. Tomorrow, we're going to have the also the lightning topics that are going to be very quick lectures. So I would like to thank everybody and every everyone, but we don't have uh, enough time to do that. But we want to thank everybody for having, for giving us the opportunity to have this event and also financing resources for, for example, 
uh, Spanish and English interpretation and so forth. The groups of research support from the University of Sao Paulo, they were very important. So the Klein that is coordinated by Professor Tess and Deer, the NUPS that is coordinated by Professor Pashevsky, and the mental health uh, research uh, uh, core that is coordinated by Professor Help, and the core coordinated by Professor Mario and Dion, uh, also the one coordinated by Paulo Saldiva, the one that is a long term planning, and also the one that I coordinate, which is the one regarding biodiversity. And we also have uh, the sustainability that is coordinated by Professor G.C. Marion. So a special thanks to Professor Silvio Canuto that has been supporting us in several ways. Uh, uh, that we are very happy to have you here. Uh, we had, uh, we went to Harvard last year with his support and we were able to bring this event to Brazil. So Professor Silvio, thank you a lot for the partnership and for your support. Also the IEA, also the special support from Professor Ari, who's the current director and ex-director and also the ex-director, Professor Paulo Saldiva, the group Planetary Health that is a group that is headquartered uh, here is uh, responsible for organizing this event. So I would also like to thank the presence of the International Alliance that is uh, on behalf of Professor Myers that had already left, that is supporting us for the growth of planetary health in, in throughout the world, especially here in Brazil. So it, it's always a pleasure to work with the group of Health Alliance with all the preparation in the annual meeting of 2021. And since I mentioned the event, I would like to remind you that one of the main reasons for us to conduct this event was to have a warm up for the annual meeting of planetary health in 2021. It was going to be here in Sao Paulo at the University of Sao Paulo campus, but be, because due to the COVID pandemic, it's going to be online. So if online we cannot be present in person, we have the advantage of reaching the, the whole world. So it's going to happen in April in 2021, and it's going to be free. So our reach is going to be much broader because of that. Please visit the website of the event, planetaryhealthannualmeeting.com, and get prepared. First of all, I'm going to share my screen here now so you can see. And here are the links for the event, planetaryhealthannualmeeting.com. And also there is a link for our group, planetaryhealth.com.br. Uh, so we already have a call for presentations for this event, both in terms of research and projects, okay? Our deadline is January 6th, so please access uh, these links and learn more. In December, uh, we will have two other calls, one to have side events based on the, on the topic, and also another call for artistic and cultural activities, which we will call the Planetary Health Festival. So please stay tuned and submit your proposals, your abstracts, your, ar your articles, your ideas of cultural uh, activities, all that you can find information about on these two pages. We count on all of you. I'd like to thank you all, all the panelists, the speakers for participating of this event. And I would like to congratulate for, so for you to and enjoy this uh, uh, seminar because it was made for you. Thank you. Okay, then I wrap up here this opening ceremony 
and I opened the event to everyone. Enjoy the event. I wish you all a great event. Wishing you all a great event too. Good morning. We're going to go to the first panel to, to just to see our online protocol, just to confirm that we have the presence of Professor Ayrton, Professor Enrique, and Professor Karina. Unfortunately, I have to let you know that Paulo Rossi Menezes, that was going to be the moderator of this panel, of panel one, uh, COVID-19 syndemias and health, uh, was called to uh, an even more relevant task. Paulo, Professor Paulo Menezes had already been uh, the coordinator of the Center of COVID-19 contingency in Sao Paulo, and he was called uh, again to, to take that place once again. And the first meeting is today, so he apologizes, but he's not going to be able to be here because he had to address a very important mission. So we're going to miss him, but let's go on. So I'm going to be the moderator for now. But of course, that the main role belongs to our colleagues here. So for this first panel, uh, COVID-19, syndemias and health systems, it, the panelists are Professor Ayrton, Professor Ayrton Del Cobon, Professor uh, uh, Ayrton Bar from Caxias do Sul, Dr. Gerson Barbosa from Sussé in São Paulo, and Professor Karina Pavão Patricia from the University of Medicine of Botucatu. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We have articulated together for you to participate here. So, uh, 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 and as agreed, Professor Ayrton is the first one to speak. Professor Ayrton, I give you the floor. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your invitation. It's a pleasure to participate in your, in your event. And it's a pleasure to present this lecture. Can you see my screen? I'm, am I sharing my screen? Can you all see? So COVID-19 is not a pandemic like uh, Lancet Editorial mentioned some time ago. It is characterized by a syndemia, which demands for a more encompassing approach from our communities. And Professor Enrique is going to approach this in more details, but it is a biological and social approach that needs to take into account interactions that need to be used for the prognostic of the society and requires a strategic of uh, health policy. So I am going to do some uh, uh, um, approach here with the help of some of the covers of the uh, uh, economy magazine, Economist magazine, because they encompass some of the international view uh, and, and it approaches also the impact of the climate change in the world. So the first cover that I chose of The Economist is this one that is from the 1st of January, just made in China, where there was an expectation to for us to uh, understand that we were about to have a pandemic and that we could already prepare our health systems to face and avoid the gravity, the severity of the pandemic. So the first uh, uh, about an infectious disease is that it spreads 
hugely and it tends to collapse the health system and the economy of the societies. And the, the other important aspect is that it generates a lot of uncertainty with scarce data, uh, preliminary data, conflicting reports that lead uh, the scientists to interpret it in the worst case scenario. And a lot of lack of information and fake news, they happen much more frequently. So on March 15th, or on March 5th, the cover of The Economist brought uh, the headline, the right medicine for the world economy. So to deal with the pandemic, there is a need for all governments, not only the not only health systems, to understand interchangeably and to have a, com a an effective communication to all community. The vigilance services need to uh, try to avoid the the severe cases during the pandemic with strategies that make it work, like, for example, using masks or social distancing, everything that is done. This kind of approach for infectious diseases uh, is very important, and uh, this will lessen the dissemination of the virus in the community. This cover of April 25th, after the disease, the death, a legacy that is very bad from uh, the pandemic is that the governments need to find the right balance between the stimulus of the economy and the shutdown of uh, commercial activities when the epidemic, when the pandemic uh, curve is going too high. And the strategy during a pandemic is to survive, both in terms of business in, uh, and in terms of the health of the people. On April 30th, the title was Life After Lockdown. It won't be easy. It's hard to think how it's going to be in the future to imagine today. And this image shows that the world is going to have an economy of 90%. It's not going to be a lockdown, but, it, it, but it's going to be very different from the normal. There will be a, a, a retraction of consumption and the levels of unemployment uh, throughout the world will increase and we will have difficulties to have new ventures. On April 22nd, that it, we celebrate the Earth Day. That is why our meeting next year is going to be on this day. And on this, and this year, uh, it was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And of course, our meeting was inside our homes and online. And there was a lot of reflection uh, regarding several activities in throughout the world, and including here in Brazil, to celebrate this topic much more online. So I thought that this affirmation uh, that was important to think that the first law of ecology, that everything is connected with everything else, and this is pretty much a presence in this pandemic. On May 14th, it was goodbye globalization, the dangerous lure of self-sufficiency. So this started a COVID-19 started a questioning in which uh, an expression in English, which is inward looking, and the best translation would be uh, look inside. That is pretty much very well represented by Donald Trump. And this was the tone of this, of the presidency of Donald Trump. And the flow of people uh, will be slower. Before globalization, there were issues. The economy will be more vulnerable. And we know how much it is important to have geopolitical instability, especially in the relationship between China and the US. May 23rd, well, the headlines were seize the opportunity the chance of flattening the climate curve so that was one of the first headlines that we saw regarding the uh, pandemic and it was precisely about climate change pandemic has shown us how difficult it will be to decarbonize and create opportunities 
So just like this event, uh, it was a simulation on uh, how a greater crisis could be in addition to the crisis that we are facing right now because of the climate change. So pandemic has shown to us the size of the challenge and the challenge of climate change will be slower than that of the uh, pandemic, but the impact will be higher and it will be longer as well. As we see the uh, pandemic will be uh, solved with a vaccine, but for climate change, there is no such thing as a vaccine. So that's the idea of the frog that lies in a hot pan and then the frog just accepts and tolerates the, the warming up pan. And in a way, climate change is slow, but the impact is devastating. Well, in June 27th, uh, the uh, headlines were the next catastrophe and how to survive it. So we have all of the scenarios of simulation that really show to us that we are going to have the risk of new pandemics. And the politicians, uh, very often they ignore the risks. I couldn't find a good word in Portuguese to characterize far and out. It's far away and far from the vision, out of the vision. So we do have to improve on that. So that's a very important reflection, the preparedness. Uh, the word is preparedness in English. It's a professional preparedness, one of the most important governance tasks. So when we elect a government, this government should be prepared to be organized uh, based on the catastrophes that might emerge. So that's one of the aspects that the pandemic has shown us the governments, the countries that were not prepared, they were the ones that had the most adverse impact. In August 22nd, uh, there was this article that was published addressing the viruses. They call it Aliens Among Us. How do viruses shape the world? Not only do they cause pandemics, but they have adapted to attack all existing organisms, especially in the oceans. So they're predators and the viruses are engines of evolution. And there are studies that show that between eight and 25% of the human genome has a viral origin. So it really shows its impact in all of the areas, areas of life all around the world. On September 12th, there is this reflection that we all do, you know. So everybody's at home. We are not, you know, in a different place. Because of having this, uh, you know, office policy, it's the dispute about the future of labor. So the offices have become a place of economic uncertainty and disputes. Technology has turned. Um, the work into an office, and then we also have to deal with the labor laws. I'm sorry, this is not exactly what I wanted to say. That's from the other slide. So there must be restructuring of the city downtowns. So we need to structurally change the city centers. In the case of women's uh, working women, working at home and working in the office, working at home, we dress more comfortably, but she does have a cat. Look at that. On September the 26th, why so many governments are doing mismanagement and they're mismanaging and using the wrong instruments as we can see in the picture. So in September, we had dexamethasone as an effective medication to control COVID infection. But unfortunately, we still had to develop many items such as the vaccine to deal with the situation. Number two, emphasizing the basic of a public health that would be epidemiological surveillance. That's one of the important aspects. In epidemiology, one of the first lessons that we learn is the concept of people time and place. And this is fundamental for the epidemiological curve, which is basic for public health. And that's what the governments should emphasize in terms of controlling the pandemic, identifying trade-offs, the counterbalance perhaps would be a better word, using masks and social distancing and open just 
key services and also supporting the most vulnerable population. As we do in Brazil, the emergency support for those who became unemployed. Well, that's the five final slide, December the 12th, celebrating the five years of the Paris Agreement. This happened on this very date, five years earlier. So all Gore writes uh, this article for the New York Times. And then he says, where I find hope. So most likely he mobilized many people around the world, including Brazilians with this uh, documentary, uh, Inconvenient Truth, an inconvenient truth back in 2002. So this discussion about the importance of uh, the impact of climate change was crawling in the world yet. And in this article, there is this sentence that drew my attention re-establishing our pact with nature and our place within the planet's ecological systems to favor not only the survival of civilization, but also to preserve uh, the wealth uh, weave of diversity to which we belong, showing here the impact of the climate change in the world that we live. So thank you so much for the attention, and I'll be here then to answer you, your questions during the Q&A session. Very nice, Ariadon, uh, quite interesting, very much educational, very nice to see the way that you introduced using uh, the headlines of The Economist. We could really follow the sequence of facts. Henrique Falseto from Caxias do Sul City in the south, south of Brazil, on to you, Henrique. Hello. So let me share my slides. Can you see my slides? So let me see if I can share my video as well. Can you guys see me as well? Yes, very well. So first, I would like to thank Professor Sariva, and I would like to thank Ariton for his introduction. I apologize for my voice. I'm a bit hoarse, but I'll do my best in trying to make everything more realistic I agreed with Professor Saraiva that I would be infected by COVID. I'm here taking dexamethasone myself to be able to feel a little bit better and deliver the talk. Of course, it, was, it wasn't on purpose, but it did happen. I've been infected by COVID. So I was serving in the front lines. So I'll speak a little bit about COVID-19, syndemics and health systems. I am a professor of the Caxias do Sul University, and I coordinate the environment working group at the uh, family doctor, doctors, and I work for the Brazilian health systems, I have no disclosure to, to make. And I begin making uh, Wonka's president's words, my words. He's the uh, from the uh, global organization of the family doctors. And then he said that during the uh, COVID pandemic, the uh, primary care are the first ones to join the battle and the last ones to leave the battle. So this really explains quite well the role that I try to play, he says. Things that I try to teach my students to contribute. I work in this municipality at the mountain, mountain range in Rio Grande do Sul State. If you look at the cursor of the computer, can you see it's in black, the black arrow? Very well. So you can find a church here. And that's my home in the woods. So I'm here right now. And I work for Family Health, the Family Health Initiative under the Brazilian Public Health System. That's my team. This is Rio Grande do Sul in the south of Brazil. Porto Alegre is the red dot and I work in the mountain range nearby. 
So when we talk about uh, planetary uh, health, I usually mention the three challenges that are addressed by the uh, classical report uh, by Rockefeller on planetary health. And Professor Samuel Myers was a key person in that report. So we do need to understand imagination, concept that is we need to be open-minded we have to search for knowledge and perhaps the most important part is implementation deployment so that's my proposition for this talk i want to provoke you what we really saw materializing and here you see the name saldiva that's professor saldiva on december 4th he delivered this wonderful speech on climate change at the Lancet countdown that was inaugurated and given by the Institute of the University of Sao Paulo on December the 4th. And then he navigated in this exercise that he's been making about the death certificate. It has to be filled in by a physician reporting the uh, disease that led to the uh, death by COVID-19. So he was quite concerned, he said, with the actual difficulties in being able to describe the worsening process, the sickening process. So he vastly spoke about this. He discussed the uh, social biological complexities that result in death by COVID-19. So it's quite difficult to be well expressed in, in documents. And this is a document that will guide the actions of the oversight agencies, the governance agencies of the Ministry of Health and so on and so forth. So based on his uh, speech, I was thinking, uh, and I decided to get in touch with Professor Saldiva. I left my own box here. And even paraphrasing here, Professor Sariva, I was trying to connect the dots. So science gives us the feeling that we have too many points. But we have to make the final drawing more clear. And the feeling that I have when I describe and I have to fill out the death certificate document of my patients as a family doctor and as the assistant, you know, physician of these patients. I'm really familiar with the uh, life, the process of health and disease. So very often it seems that the death certificate is a tumbling, stumbling block, actually. Perhaps it's comparable to a child that is, uh, you know, learning uh, the ABCs, uh, the, the parts of the word, the syllables, but they cannot actually uh, develop sentences or make sense. So my daughter, she's six, she's becoming literate. So that's an analogy that I could make. So how can we um, use the death certificate? to try and make more sense, to make it clear what the actual situation is. And I think the first step is based on this Horton's article published at The Lancet saying that COVID-19 is not a pandemic. So it was quickly disseminated in the society. So BBC News made a special report discussing whether it's pandemic or syndemic. And to me, that was a penny dropping. So the word syndemic will become increasingly uh, stronger in our lexicon within the most basic tools to be able to understand planetary health. So syndemic is putting together two words, epidemic, which is more traditional, even in medicine, and synergy, which is a word that arises from physics, as far as I know. So it has to do with the sum of vectors of energy that eventually will interact 
between themselves and eventually there'll be this uh, retro feedback. So this basic concept was taken from this uh, wonderful article written for the Lancet explaining that syndemic is a biosocial complex which consists of interacting co-presently or sequentially with uh, diseases or with social and environmental factors that will promote deleterious effects of pathological interaction resulting in suffering. So whenever I see my obese patients, and unfortunately I lost some patients to COVID infection, and not rarely were they obese. So the first patient that I lost was an obese patient, like the one that you see in this picture. If I am to go back for the death certificate to this patient of mine, and if I am to re-describe, you know, pneumonia by COVID leading to death, describing diabetes, describing hypertension, describing obesity, I get the feeling that we are losing something in this process. That's my obese patient. That's the wealth of information. This obese patient in the uh, pandemic. So you can see here, this is a methodology that addresses the multiple distal and proximal factors of the day-to-day -day of such patient that will result in the obesity condition, which is a pandemic as well. But this pandemic is very hard to synthesize, although the syllables are all there. So Lancet made this report addressing obesity, undernutrition, and climate change as a syndemic. So perhaps we can you know, follow that line of thought. That's where my provocation goes to you. So here, we do have some other perspectives. So we use Lancet, uh, some tools that Lancet uses in its reports on climate change and obesity. So a whirlwind here and the microsystems, the macro system, the natural systems with uh, all of the aspects of the day-to-day -day of people. How these multiple aspects generate obesity and that reinforce nutrition and that reinforce climate changes. And here is a different point of view, a more individual point of view from that patient. Well, the question is, can we use this know-how? Then we have uh, these three requisites and these challenges so that we advance in this content of planetary health. I imagine that Professor Saudiva has advanced in the need of at least provoke this need for the death certificate to be more effective in the way to contextualize and convey really the message of what's happening, the real narrative. Uh, the imagination, I think, is something that we are already going into very strongly. Knowledge, I believe that the that Lancet's report by uh, uh, about obesity and lack of nutrition consolidates it very deeply because I invite everybody to read it. Uh, the nutrologists, uh, uh, they have paid lots of compliments on that because it's a very interesting report. And I think that we can start implementing this uh, idea of syndemic. 
So when I go back to the death certificate and when I think about the pathology that has contributed for that to happen, I think that we could think and I think that we could add COVID-19 syndemic. This is one more alert in the history uh, of Horton, maybe a hypothesis, but COVID syndemic it, to me is not well established like syndemic of obesity, you know, and in the case of nutrition that has already an extense work of the Lancet Commission report, report that it's much more robust. This one, I would feel very safe to register in the uh, death certificate, certificate and also hypertension too is already well established. To wrap up, I conducted a brief review and I approach the methodology <laughs> view of that. And I'm going to ha a uh, ask uh, the professor to help. And I've seen in the literature that obesity aggravates COVID-19. I found in the literature components that express clearly syndemic <laughs> of obesity with COVID-19. So I think that this can be a benchmark in the way we register the death certificate. And if we transform this death certificate in a tool for a more effective communication, I think that we can plan better what happens in society. And this last picture illustrates a little bit the human development and this uh, last phenotype that is of course a, a, a kind of a joke, but it's not a joke, but this does not need to be our phenotypic development. If we consider the syndemic aspects that lead us to this uh, obesity syndemic pandemic with climate changes. They are fundamentally cultural, social, with a biosocial phenomena. And I think that if they're so, we can avoid it, them to happen and better and worse consequences. Thank you so much. Henrique, thank you so much for your explanation, for your effort. Of course, we are going to talk a lot about, about that uh, in the past. I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Gerson Laurindo Barbosa, president of Susen in Sao Paulo. Gerson, please. Good morning, everyone. First, I would like to thank Professor Saraiva for the invitation to participate here and to be discussing here with you in a very interesting moment for discussion in which we are going through this COVID-19 pandemic and also for, for, for thank Professor Ayrton uh, that had a brilliant presentation showing also the complexity that this pandemic has brought us because it's not a pandemic that has affected people's health, but it has affected the global health system and generally all the planet. What's interesting is that if on one hand it brought us a problem, it also has led us to reflect, to think uh, what science can bring in terms of arrangements and adjustments for us to advance, for us to learn and live with this kind of problem. 
I think that science has brought us several answers. It was very agile and fast. And without science, it is very hard for us to move forward. So that leads us to think that at the same time that COVID was affecting people throughout the world, we also had other diseases that did not cease to exist, that did not cease to happen simultaneously with COVID. And so what can we learn from that uh, regarding what has been done in terms of COVID, like social distancing, isolation, and, and what can this affect the other diseases? Like, for example, I'm going to talk about dengue. For example, I work with the control of dengue in the state of Sao Paulo. We can we we control the vector we don't control the disease the disease is only treated and we can observe that in this moment when we were facing simultaneously the covid pandemic uh, that has quickly spread throughout the world we had to face also the pandemic the endemic of dengue that had already been happening in our country so let me change the slide here. Just to make a comparison, uh, because Professor has already conceptualized uh, very much this idea of syndemic. So if when we think about syndemic, can we consider dengue a syndemic too? Since it is also a disease that impacts several societies. So this makes us think and another thing that I brought, that I brought from the website of Planetary Health is that dengue has this concept because it also does not respect borders. It affects beyond borders. It, and to only to contextualize for those who do not do what dengue is, Dengue is a viral disease, and also uh, it's a it has a different transmission from COVID nineteen. It's transmitted by the mosquito Aedes aegypti, and this mosquito is originated in Africa. So this also shows an impact of globalization. So Aedes came from Africa at the time where they brought the slaves and it spread here in the Americas and to the rest of the world this way. So currently we have four uh, serum types of the, the virus. Uh, and once you have had the disease with one of the types, you become immune to that type, but you still can get sick with the other types of virus. So uh, it is a disease that is curable, but some people die of this disease too. So just like the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we also have the epidemic of dengue, the epidemic of dengue. It's more, uh, it, dengue is a more seasonable, seasonal disease because it happens more in warm countries. And in addition to being seasonal, seasonal, it's also cyclic. And there are moments where there are several cases and then we have periods where we, where the cases lessen a little bit. So I think we have to face uh, see dengue as uh, the flu or as a cold, you know, they, they happen in cycles. And for you to understand what is the cycle of the disease as it's been happening the past years, is that along the less, the, the most recent years, the epidemics have been increasing. So 
With more and more time, we've been observing a larger number of municipalities that have this explosion of cases. So this is what you see in orange here. So here you see the cycle of the disease from 2010, then 2011, then 2012, then we lessened, there were less cases. Then in 2013, the cases, the cases started to increase again. Then 13, 14, and 17, and 18, we almost didn't have any cases of dengue. These numbers are related to the state of Sao Paulo. So this shows the level of infestation of the mosquito. So this is the blue line. So you ob we observe here a trend for a decrease in the infestation. So we have a limit to our control program. So this program in Sao Paulo in Brazil for the vector is a very expensive program based on home visits and the elimination and reduction of breeders. And we, our objective is to achieve the uh, objectives of the program, which, which is to eliminate the source or have at least a very low uh, intensity for them so that we have uh, uh, lower levels of uh, uh, the disease. We know that these epidemics uh, cause, affect the economy because uh, of the number of days that people lose, uh, working days that people miss. And there was a very important report uh, uh, showing the cost for the global economy of COVID-19. And dengue has also this uh, consequence. Of course, it's a different level, but it also causes uh, uh, financial uh, uh, damages, economic damages for the country, uh, not only in terms of working days, but also in terms of the cost and maintenance to treat the disease. So if we look at the years of 2017 and 2018, where we have a low level of cases in 2019, for example, in the state of Sao Paulo, we started having another cycle of increase in the transmission of dengue in the state of Sao Paulo and an increase in the number of cases. So. If we consider this path that we have been observing uh, over the past 20, 10 years, the cycles, every time that the cycle starts, it remains for two and to three years. So what do we expect for 2020? We expect an increase in the number of dengue cases in the state of Sao Paulo compared to 2019, for example. What we observe is that in 2020, this red line uh, begins with an increase compared to 2019. So it's expected that in 2020, this curve is going to go up and it's going to stay above the year of 2019. So this was already expected due to this, the path that we have been following. What we observed is that in the beginning of the year, in January, the epidemic, it started to spread throughout Europe and in large proportions. And it starts, and we start the detection of the first cases here in Brazil in mid-February. So we see that here we have a very huge impact with COVID-19, and then we observe this decrease in the curve. So this is what we discuss with our colleagues. What does this decrease mean? What was the impact of this COVID-19 pandemic in the transmission of dengue? So with some data, we 
conducted a preliminary evaluation and wrote a letter communicating the McTrevor medicine that we could have the measures of control for COVID-19 in Brazil. So we'll have measures against COVID-19 help to reduce 10 cases in Brazil. And then we started working on this data using the isolation data uh, and the trends. We evaluated the cases of dengue that happened where in, in the municipalities where there was uh, this isolation measures. And we concluded that yes, the, the social, social isolation, social distancing due to uh, COVID-19 impacted in reducing the cases of dengue in Sao Paulo. And this is a very important data for our program because this gives us some light for us to discuss and evaluate some measures regarding the way that uh, dengue, is, dengue spreads throughout the state of Sao Paulo. Of course, that it's not feasible to think that social uh, distancing for dengue cases is of course nothing, it's, it's something that's not feasible. But what we have learned along the years is that over the past five years, we observed that the biggest intensity, the largest density of dengue cases here is around a road that we know pretty well, that is Anhanguera, Bandeirantes, that is a region that goes from Rio Preto all the way through Aracatuba. So we know that this is a region that is, where the disease is very prevalent. So now we understand what is the, the importance of uh, immunity in the spread of this kind of diseases of diseases. So there are several uh, papers in the li literature that talk about this, of how much we deep, we need to evaluate this mobility, try to understand this mobility uh, in micro regions, in macro regions. And if we are able to understand uh, how people move uh, 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 in between the municipalities, between the regions, uh, from the moment we, we need, we have the dang cases, we need to have So that's our target now, working in this um, in this area to get to know the mobility, to try and propose intervention strategies that are differentiated because a control program today is linear. So the actions are carried out similarly in all municipalities and states. And we believe that the um, desired effect doesn't happen in addition to having a high cost. If you look at the south of the state of Sao Paulo, we see the intensity of the uh, transmission is much lower than in the other regions, um, including the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo state. So that's the purpose. We want to work with mobility. In spite of all of the issues um, that we are facing with uh, COVID-19, it still has been causing, you know, many adverse effects. And I think it's going to remain for a while up until the vaccination makes it um, effect, but we had this uh, single opportunity of assessing empirically uh, the uh, issue of uh, social uh, distancing and less movement of people, enabling the dengue fever transmission to be a little bit below. Well, the radius of flight is very small, so the virus is taken from one region to another by people, quite similarly with the uh, COVID. So if we work with mobility, that's highly important. That's where, where we are investing our efforts to try and advance with our program and to be able to propose new intervention strategies. 
That's what I had to say. That's what I had to discuss with you. So I'm here available to answer any questions. And thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Jerson. Uh, it's a quite interesting aspect of broadening our focus to speak about something that affects us. We didn't stop having issues with dengue fever just because we got COVID. So now, Professor Kayan Patricio, the professor of the Medicine School of Botucatu in the state of Sao Paulo, thank you for your presence here with us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here with you. It's a great honor to be able to participate in this group that works with a, such a noble cause that is planetary health. And closing the year with this event in such a challenging year, well, we've had so many learnings, but that's invitation to reflecting uh, for a deeper change in 2021. So I hope, I hope that we inaugurate next year with a such outlook in mind. So let me share my screen with you. Very well. In 2020, we had this virus that prevailed in everyone's lives and in the planet. We know that 60% of the infectious diseases are disseminated through animals to human beings. So we have emerging diseases that also come from animals. And the uh, zoonosis pathogens, they are deeply related to degradation, the environmental degradation that we cause in our planet. We have the human settlements together with the animals, and also the feed system is involved as we saw it happening in the case of uh, COVID. So as we could realize from my colleagues, the colleagues that came before me, we may realize how much this uh, syndemic is a prism that is affected and affects the many forms of life, the many relations that we all have. So it is up to me to provide you with a reflection so that we can think about the impact of COVID in the environment and vice versa. I mean, how the environment may impact COVID-19. From a positive stance, one may observe the improvement of the air pollution, the improvement of the sound pollution, the noise level, and so many other improvements in nature, right? We see a more bountiful nature around us, but also the production of waste, both medical and domestic waste have increased a lot. And on the other side, some recent studies try to demonstrate the association, perhaps temperature, humidity, or pollution, will they favor the uh, dissemination of uh, COVID? What happens in the environment that can actually improve the situation and reduce the dissemination? So here are some items for us to reflect upon about the data that we have been collecting uh, in recent days. So when we see the air pollution, the concentration of nitrogen dioxide. So here we can see the results for some uh, countries in Europe in April 2020. It's an European uh, study. So when we have the lockdown 
there is a sharp reduction of the uh, concentration of uh, nitrogen oxide. That's one of the key indicators of the global economic activities. So when we had Professor Ayrton, he was talking about the environmental impacts and the economic impacts as well. So the world stopped in many, in many areas. So the, the were reductions of NO2, and they have to do with the burning of uh, fossil uh, fuels, fuels. And 80% is due to the exhaustion system of vehicles. So it really shows a sharp reduction. In Spain, a reduction of 61%. The concentrations went down that much. And in many other countries, Portugal and so on and so forth, showing how much the emission reduced because of the lockdown. What's the other side of the coin? Pollution. How does it affect COVID? We know that people who are exposed to higher concentrations of air pollutants, they have a higher prevalence of respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. And the same conditions, the pre-existing conditions, they're also associated to the uh, severity of the uh, COVID infection. So the question is, places with higher air pollution, do we have a high mortality rate by COVID in such places? In an Italian uh, studies, they are investigating a particulate material, ozone and sulfur dioxide because by weakening the uh, airways, the immune defense of the upper uh, airways, that facilitates the entrance of COVID in the lower respiratory tract. But it's an early study and we need to be careful with the interpretation of this data. Particulate material, or can the virus actually piggyback on such material? So we have to analyze the feasibility of the virus in such particles. There was this study in the Pantanal region in Brazil seeking to investigate precisely this matter related to the burnings and particulate material if the virus can be uh, disseminated, if it remains feasible on such particles. And then here's uh, showing some uh, images that we saw from China, close to Wuhan. In a month, in a short period of time, we can see the concentration of NO2 that reduced drastically, as in the city of Sao Paulo in very few days. This fills us with hope, demonstrating that nature can be regenerated if we are able to act now, not only in the short term, but in the long term as well. Addressing environmental sustainability so that this is part of the agenda of the nations. So this really shows that nature can be regenerated. Speaking of uh, climate change and the greenhouse gases, has a Lancet countdown has been showing to us this is a threat to the humankind life in this planet. That's what climate change is. And we are suffering because of the uh, greenhouse gases emissions. With COVID, we could also see this positive effect. Initially, we had a global reduction of 17% uh, of all of the emissions. And then in June, it goes down. Same goes for carbon in China and the US. They also reduced their emissions. But we need to take a look at the long term as well. For example, transportation. 
or the reduction of a uh, roadway and airway transportation systems. We had a reduction of the uh, domestic and international flights. In China, we had a reduction of international flights close to 40% and domestic flights 70%. That really affects you know, the reduction of greenhouse gases emissions and carbon emissions as well. But as I said, we have to be attentive to all of this. We have to see this as a, a lesson learned. COVID has taught this lesson to us and nature may be regenerated in a short term. I'm quite optimistic, but uh, lately I was, you know, tracking the climate change trends and I was very much worried and I was disappointed with the human stance. I was questioning whether we could reverse the scenario in a short period of time that is left to us. But then COVID has come to prove that, yes, we can do that. It's possible to be done, but it has to be included in the governmental agendas. For example, the UK expert, Corinne, she talks about this large risk because we saw that happening. We saw the reduction of emissions in the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. We witnessed such reductions in the emissions, but shortly after they were resumed and re resumed more intensively than what they were before. So this has to be included in the governmental agendas, a more sustainable resumption of activities. So how can environment influence COVID? So the climate conditions are under investigation. Lower temperature, for example, and lower humidity. So perhaps this could favor the uh, dissemination of COVID-19. But we have to keep track of the seasonality for a longer time in different climate zones. So it's a multifactorial matter. We shouldn't be addressing just the climate issues as Enrique showed us. We have syndemic, the syndemic, which is multifactorial. So we have to pay attention to the health services. And in the case of Brazil, primary care is very well organized. So we have to see what the response is. The response was much higher than that of other places. So all of these factors are added to compose this scenario of COVID-19. Now speaking about waste, I've been working hard in our hospital and the COVID cases increased. So the production of solid waste, hospital waste, everything increased. So the UN, I mean the WHO, estimated a monthly consumption of these materials at great scales, at large scales. They're all based on plastic, right? They are from non-renewable sources from oil plastics. And in Yuhan, the volume of waste produced grew five-fold in the hospitals and in our homes as well, because people are buying online. They are receiving, you know, the uh, delivered products and the products come with a lot of packaging and these are all disposable materials. So that's an issue that we have been facing. We need to find a solution. There's also the fear. We have the recyclers, the, the garbage collectors, the cooperatives that deal with the recycled products. They're afraid of recycling medical products. In our Hospital das Clinicas in Botucatu City, so I've had this project since 2014, we get the organic uh, waste from our kitchen and we established a partnership with some family farmers and they get this organic material to do composting and to produce food items, produce cultures. Early on, they came to me and said, well, professor, I'm sorry, we are very much afraid. There are many elderly farmers. We would like to stop the uh, flow of organic material to us. 
coming from the hospital. So the market will buy recyclable materials, possibly a plastic, but this has reduced a lot associated to the oil barrel price. So we also have the um, greater uh, primary production of such plastics and packaging. So in closing, nature, I've been uh, surveying about this topic and COVID actually gives us a present. We are about to end this year. Let's address the good things, you know, amidst the turmoil, the difficult phases that we have passed. But how much nature has been regenerated? It's a gift. We see animals. Some are fake news, I know, such as the one that we saw in Venice. But anyhow, the animals are out there, the, the birds the oceans as well. So they are taking over the spaces, the niches that belonged to them in the past. And we seized, we somehow, you know, occupied their territory. There are some groups surveying how much urban nature can become resilient areas within the city promoting well-being with safety because of the safety distancing and that's possible in such areas it's possible to promote social distancing so that we can enjoy the well-being and the connection with nature that is so much beneficial uh, some pictures there's so many, but these are some pictures addressing the water. That's in India. In India, we have an issue with the uh, domestic and industrial waste that are dumped on the rivers. We had a reduction of 500% of the uh, sewage and industrial effluents being thrown on the rivers. And Sao Paulo as well, as we can see in the uh, comparative pictures. So we have air pollution and the appearance is better, right? It's no longer blurred. We see the reduction of traffic on the road and also the water quality. The water in the bottom reflects the, the skyline. So the studies have all shown that the connection with nature results in improved health especially mental health it improves anxiety depression stress but also the physical health it improves the uh, hypertension diabetes and even the immunological system well japan has the bath of forests in the health system showing how much this can improve our health so that's an invitation that goes to you so that we can you know resume the connection with nature not only with the media and everything that we are living right now we have to seize the opportunity the isolation moments that we are experiencing right now so may we re-establish our connection with nature benefiting from it this should be part of the agendas of the city the green spaces the, the squares that are kept well, that are, that are well maintained, keeping people's access to such venues. And to close, another chart. Here we have the graphics that we present first, where we have this uh, lesson that the pandemic has brought us. Negativas. É, ambientalmente, aqui falando, que me cabe esse foco agora, e mais várias positivas também, né, e de novo, assim, que a gente possa olhar para isso e dizer, não, se a gente adotar essas medidas, né, como o nosso seminário aqui de, do Agir Agora, é exatamente isso, né, a gente, se a gente agir agora, a gente consegue manter e, essa, e garantir uma qualidade de vida, né? não só para as próximas gerações, mas para as nossas e para as que já estão aqui. Né? Então, é, eu gosto dessa, 
essa reflexão né, que a própria diretora executiva do Programa das Nações Unidas para o Meio Ambiente, ela fala, que, é, que, que nos alerta, né, a natureza está nos enviando né, uma mensagem com essa sindemia, vamos assim dizer, né, e com a atual crise climática. Não cuidar do planeta significa não cuidar de nós mesmos. Né? E esse slogan que a gente adotou ano passado, né, no, no lançamento do relatório do Lance Countdown, e de fato só temos uma casa, um planeta, né? Por mais óbvio que isso seja, a gente não tem adotado ações dessa forma. Né? E a pandemia também nos chama, do Covid, é, nos chama a maior lição de cidadania. Né? Que estamos de fato conectados e que eu faço é, interfere na vida do outro e assim é na saúde planetária. Né? Então... Minha profunda gratidão né, a essa manhã. Esse, para mim, vai ser o encerramento do, do evento do ano. Né? É, Pandemic, for this uh, uh, opportunity. And I hope that we can really transform these actions into something more sustainable for planetary health. Ok, so I would like to thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you, Karina. Thank you for uh, what you presented here. Uh, you, we are showing different visions, each of us, and I think this is very rich for all of us. And we are going to have some minutes to debate now, so you can send messages. People can send messages now uh, via questions and answers on Zoom. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you can ask questions directly on the chat and we're going to capture them. So there are some questions that were sent here. I'm going to ask you to be brief so that we can address all the questions. The first question, I think that uh, the that has a quick answer, goes to Henrique, Henrique Cavalcante. Henrique, what is the origin of this concept of syndemic? And the approach regarding obesity is being more well spread during COVID-19, the problem of obesity. The, so the terminology syndemic is, uh, 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 it's a uh, no, terminology and it's pretty much consolidated in literature uh, with lines of uh, research in the National Institute of Health in the United States. The terminology synd obesity syndemic and climate change and malnutrition is something new. It's been here for like one or two years, I guess, through the report uh, 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 written by Lancet. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, we have one to Jason from Richard. Jason, the strike of the truck drivers that happened in 2018 would be another opportunity to evaluate the effects of mobility regarding dengue. Well, I think, yes, it, it, it could be uh, uh, an opportunity, but since the strike was relatively short, maybe we did we do not have enough data to conduct uh, uh, through evaluation. But I think that there are already approaches that discuss this issue of mobility uh, in face of the the occurrence of cases of dengue and things like that. So it would be an opportunity. But I think that due to the short duration of the strike, I think we don't have enough data to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gerson. We have a question from Saulo Gamarro that is watching us from Peru. He says, thank you, Saulo, for joining us. He says the battle against COVID-19 has been guided, especially through uh, models, uh, uh, moderators of the epidemic and specialists on infectious diseases. Do you think we could change the strategy? Do you think we could include more specialists? 
that uh, I'll leave it open so that you all can answer this question, but maybe I don't can start. Thank you for the question. And yes, in fact, like I said during my presentation, it is an intersectorial kind of action. So intervention, we need a lot of interventions to deal with this situation. So I was uh, reading a, a report about social determinants that is that was uh, uh, con done by Marmot. It's a revision about COVID-19, and the name of this uh, report is to build better. It's a model for this report. Uh, when we think about uh, building better, we also need building fair, you know, build again in a more fair way. So uh, uh, based on this, this question of this, our friend from Peru, we want a world with more equality, a more egalitarian world. Can I, can I make a comment here? Uh, we've seen some discussion. Biden has been has talked has been talking a lot about build back better, and I uh, I also I'm a signatory uh, uh, from Onca, the, the family doctors, of that letter that uh, called health recovery. That for us of the planetary health is a more precise word because build back fairer or reconstruct in a more in a fairer way does not uh, uh, state clearly the issue of health that is central both for equality and for the notion of clean energies i think that health recovery is a more interesting terminology to be used. Okay. Jasmine and Karina, feel free if you want to say something, just feel free. Otherwise, I have another question here. That is from Jennifer Tanaka. It's a question. She asks, what is the relationship between the concept of planetary health and unique health? Eu posso. Vai, vai então, Henrique. Okay, Henrique, you can you can answer then. No, no, I don't. You, you, can, you can answer. I, uh, my voice is a little bit weak. So we have already discussed in the group that terminology is something given by each author, be, by each institution. There's no consensus. So the first aspect to, to mention is that there's no consensus. There is also global health. They are, and I believe that they are concepts that are complementary and sometimes uh, uh, I think that what's important is to include all the aspects that lead us to have a more encompassing view, a more comprehensive view that take into consideration the impact of climate in the, in the life of humanity. And of course, of course, that one health is not uh, uh, it shows that we have to be worried not only about humanity, but about all the biodiversity. So do you have anything to, to add? Yes, if I can comment something here too. I know I'm only a moderator, but I want to make a point here is that we have different health, one health, Eco health, eco health, planetary health, uh, and I believe that they appeared uh, from different communities, academic 
different academic communities more focus on the interaction of human and animal health. But I understand that over the past years, they have converged into being more comprehensive and, and encompassing and addressing basically the same things. Uh, but focus but with focus on communities that are originally different, but everybody understands that this is an issue that has to be addressed in a very comprehensive global way, considering all the aspects of impact, the human health, which is, is an Anthropocene uh, uh, view, because we are thinking about that, we are the ones thinking about that, but also considering the human being and the planet, you know, and although they have different origins, they are converging. I particularly think that planetary health as an original concept is or more encompassing. If we look at the report of 2015, if you have never seen it on the page of IEA, uh, uh, planet, planetary health, IEA.com.br, we have the report by Lancet. And that report shows clearly the complexity of the multiple factors uh, regarding health and well-being of the of humans and of the planet not only health as uh, uh, from the point of view of medicine but from the perspective of well-being too i would like to ask a question to that is a question from luis gustavo luis gustavo is asking the following question what are the implications for the researches that are based on the assumptions of uh, based on complex thought or systemic thought both for COVID-19 and other areas of knowledge so uh, what is the the importance of assuming this complexity uh, 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 presumption Thank you for the question. I think that this I understood very well, but in fact, I think that we need to bring this, of course, not only to research, but also to the education of these the students and the trainings of uh, health professionals, because we have been working especially within the group of planetary health, the complexity of the factors of the social environmental determinant. And we are acting, uh, that they are acting and they are showing us on a daily basis. And I think that COVID-19 is a very good example uh, that uh, uh, shows the, this issue of syndemic. And we have to review this model and it has been reviewed not only from the perspective of research, but also from the structuring of the education. And so I think there are other areas that we need to, to understand that we need this more complex approach. I'm going to repeat and also comment something uh, that there will be a session that will last uh, all day long that that is going to discuss the role of research, you know, and in one of them, there will be a panel to discuss that. It, it includes this multidisciplinary uh, uh, research to address all these complex uh, uh, problems of today and how to approach that in the academia. Uh, so don't miss this session. I think that also the last question, so that we stick to time, I'm going to open this question to the four of you, if you can answer briefly. What is the importance of a health system like SUS, like the system of SUS, for uh, to approach problems like COVID and other diseases that affect people in a broader way? Well, I think that it is a very good question. 
this mo at this moment where we always ask uh, question the uh, funding of uh, uh, health services and of course uh, SUS has a major role in the structuring in the uh, vigilance epidemiological vigilance and and in stating a declaration of uh, uh, conflict of interest to the society as a whole, not in envisioning profits like the private uh, entities have. So the, the public system is fundamental, especially in a very, in a society that is not egalitarian like ours. And because we saw that for this pandemic, the more vulnerable population had the major impact, felt the major impact. So uh, going back to the previous question, the research is fundamental to evaluate health, the health services to see what's working and what's not working. And especially in our country, there is a, a primary uh, attention uh, and uh, epidemiological vigilance, they, these were the places where we had a better uh, results, where these services were in place. So, in complementing, I had said that, that uh, primary service, primary attention, like here in Brazil with SUS, we could see that in several places where we have uh, primary primary services that are well organized that put that to test. You know, the vigilance is uh, when we talk about uh, vigilance, health vigilance, and we talked about that more theoretically, but now we could see is uh, sanitary vigilance, environmental vigilance, uh, in a more collective way within schools that is present in our life as Brazilian citizens. So this model uh, of uh, primary service, primary attention, and we could see how much this was uh, effective in facing COVID in the different scenarios. Of course, that we have this uh, uh, country that is not so egalitarian, but also in other countries, when we observe other countries, how they've been facing the disease, like, for example, in the United States, we could see that the several difficulties that they faced and in other countries like England, like Germany, that were more organized and organized in a more universal way, that this control was higher and had better results. So, as the other colleagues said, and reinforcing the idea of the syndemic, if we believe that the uh, COVID issue is a uh, syndemic, and I'm convinced of that. If we address COVID cross-sectionally, thinking about vaccines only, ventilators only, or primary care only, or thinking about dexamethasone only. And then in this case, we are going to be acting fragmentedly and we are going to lose the opportunity to gain scale and to promote synergies uh, between these uh, many tools. Well, this was uh, described at the Lancet article quite well, by the way, and I used it as a reference to study syndemic. It's a counter syndemic effect they talk about. That is, we go to the roots of the problem and we act more distally on the effects. And I apologize for my voice.
microphone. So it's 11.03. Let's stay on time. And I would like to thank Professor Ayrton Stein, Enrique Barros, Gerson Barbosa, and Karina Pavão, Patricio, our panelists. They were quite interesting and inspiring interventions. They four are part of the uh, group, the Planetary Health in Brazil, and they're going to be joining us in many other events. Thank you. Stay well, stay healthy. And Enrique, of course, we are hoping that you recover as soon as possible. And now we have a 12 minute break. We resume the session at 11.15 sharp with uh, Professor Elizabeth Rubachevsky. She's here with us with the next panel that is environmental health and rights. Thank you.
Olá, Elizabeth. Tudo bom? Elizabeth, é Braulio, tudo bom? Você está sem som. Ah, desculpa, hum. agora estamos com som. <risos> Isso, a pergunta é se eu entrei no link correto para a sessão que vai começar daqui a pouco. Sim, entrou sim. A, a, a Márcia já está aqui. Agora a nossa questão é se todos os nossos colegas já estão aqui. Elizabeth, eu vou fazer uso de alguns slides em PowerPoint. E aí eu vou precisar da autorização para compartilhar na minha tela. Sim, é, eu acho que isso daí é por conta de que do do, é, do
Very well. Good morning, everyone. So Sergio has to begin broadcasting, okay? So Sergio, will you that will you let us know? Okay. You may begin. Okay. Good morning, everyone. In our second panel, we are going to focus on the synergies and intersections between the health, the environment areas, specifically addressing the impacts of these dynamics on our rights. For this debate, we are going to have four experts, Professors Braulio Dias, Eduardo Viola, Eduardo Mario Mediondo and Marcia Chami. Professor Brolio, that will begin with the presentation, is a PhD in zoology from the Edinburgh uh, University, and he runs the uh, National Program of Biological Diversity and the Biodiversity of uh, Genetic Resources under the uh, Secretariat of Biodiversity and Forests under the Ministry of the Environment. So, Professor Brolio, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to participate in this session. I'm going to show my slides. Let me see if I can share them. Where is it? Can you see that? Yes, Professor Brolio, we can see that. You just have to switch to the presentation mode, please. Okay, thank you. So I'll be speaking about the uh, relationship between the uh, biodiversity global agenda and the health global agenda, especially the uh, cooperation that we established between the UN Convention on Biological Diversity and the World Health Organization. First off, Well, the One Health initiative that was created, it doesn't translate well into Portuguese, he says, because One Health can be read in two different ways, as the number one and as the indefinite uh, concept of one. The aim is integrating human health protection together with domestic animal protection and the wildlife protection. There is a transfer of diseases between animals and humans. So many human epidemics arise from zoonosis. So that's the interrelationship between the three areas. There is the action of physicians and veterinarians and biologists and conservationists uh, towards this direction. At CDB, at our institute, and just to remind you that the construction of the One Health began as early as 10 decades ago, based on academic initiatives, and then based on the creation of a cooperation between the World Health Organization, the International Organization of Animal Health, the OIE and FAO, and many other international bodies. And this was linked and followed by many meetings to promote a more integrated approach on the health sector in many countries, including Brazil, and that took place in 2014. In 2014, we also had the official uh, implementation of this kind of approach in our country. At the global level, at the UN level, at the uh, biodiversity, the 
Biological Diversity Convention. We began at COP10 that took place in 2010 in Nagoya in Japan. There was this decision that created the new strategic global plan of biodiversity, establishing a strategic target to promote the ecosystem services, specifically those that are related to water supply, contributing to health and to the livelihood and well-beings of human populations, especially women, indigenous uh, communities, and other traditional communities, and also the poor and the vulnerable. At COP11 that took place in 2012 in Hyderabad in India, the 11-6 decision was adopted, recognizing the importance of uh, cooperation with international organizations. And more specifically, it recognized the uh, cooperation between the Biodiversity Convention and the World Health Organization and the joint decision to create a joint work program encompassing both organizations. COP12 that took place in Korea from the decision 12 slash 21, there was a, a series of guidelines that were approved for establishing the joint work program between the CBD and the World Health Organization. And this was uh, put into force right after. So this joint program was formalized in COP13 in Cancun in Mexico. There was another decision which is highly important that was approved addressing in detail the many implementation aspects of this uh, coordination work between the CBD and the WHO. And at COP14 that took place in Egypt in November 2018, many agreements were signed between the two organizations. So this joint work program addressing biodiversity and health was then established formally in 2012. And it sets forth many, many initiatives, establishing an initiative between the biodiversity and the human health agendas. And then I'm going to be briefly showing you some of the aspects. Well, the first initiative of this program was the uh, publication of this technical scientific work. More than 100 scientists worked in cooperation, including many uh, scientists from the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation here in Brazil. And the title of the report is Global Priorities that is connecting global priorities, biodiversity, and human health. And I was uh, the author of the prologue of this work, and I took place in many meetings, and I was able to formally launch the efforts of this project. There are 16 chapters addressing the many aspects of the interconnections between that biodiversity and human health. So agricultural biodiversity, for example, is addressed. Nutrition and the nutritional value of foods, uh, food uh, security and water security, air quality, the risks uh, resulting from environmental disasters, climate change, quality of the water, microbial biodiversity, and all the many challenges associated to the growing resistance uh, of bacteria against antibiotics, also infectious diseases which are highly relevant, and they are disseminated indeed uh, because of the vectors that go 
back and forth uh, between the co continents, such as the flies that can, mosquitoes that can transmit such diseases, issues related to traditional medicine, issues related to mental health, issues related to the development of new drugs and new vaccines that have to use the uh, genetic resources and the associated traditional knowledge. That's why CBD sets the rule for the access to genetic resources and associated uh, traditional knowledge. So we foresee the sharing of benefits with the owners of such resources and the owners of such knowledge. So it is a piece of publication that broadly addresses the interconnections between biodiversity and health. Well, we cooperate through CBD and I was leading the way at the time. So we were engaged in la launching the initiative of planetary health. This was published by the Lancet magazine with the support of the Rockefeller Foundation and that took place in 2015. So it was highly important and CDB really supported this initiative. CDB also widely supported PNUMA, the United Nations Program for the Environment. In the following year, in 2016, it, it really published this important report called A Healthy Environment, Healthy People. And it addressed the many aspects of the interconnection between the, the themes. At this time in 2015, the General Assembly, the Assembly General of the United Nations approved the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development with the 17 SDGs. So we do have an SDG dedicated to health, that is SDG number three, but this chart really shows that human health is truly affected by the themes that are addressed in many other SDGs. So we have SDG one that is fighting and eradicating extreme poverty, SDG number two that uh, addresses a sustainable agriculture and food security, SDG number six addressing water supply security, SDG number 11 addressing sustainable cities, SDG 3, addressing the climate change, SDG 12, addressing sustainable production and consumption, and finally, two other SDGs that are fully oriented to the environment. Number 14, addressing marine life, life in oceans and SDG number 15, addressing the uh, land and uh, freshwater ecosystems, as well as forests, desertification and the extinction of species as well. So it's an umbrella agenda that we have here. And he also provides us with an opportunity to better take care of the interfaces between the environmental agenda, more specifically the biodiversity agenda and the agenda of human health. It's worth pointing out that CDB approved this initiative called Biodiversity for Food Supply and Nutrition. And the four elements, one is promoting development and documenting relevant knowledge, two, integrating biodiversity and dealing with the food supply and nutrition into the research networks and within the uh, policy instruments. Element number three is uh, conserving and promoting a wider, wider use of biodiversity in food supply and in nutrition. We know that we've had a severe issue in the last decades. We are increasingly dependent on a lower number of food items. There are just six key food items that account for more than three fourths of the human diet. So this has really increased our vulnerability. 
and it has really reduced the nutritional value of what we consume in human diet. Element number four is the uh, promotion of a greater public awareness together with environmental education on these topics. Let me just say that in Brazil, we do have quite interesting initiatives and they are connected to the uh, production uh, of higher nutritional value foods and safer foods. For example, the agroecology and organic production plan that was awarded internationally in 2018. I draw your attention as well to the uh, supply chains of what we call the social biodiversity. And these are the foodstuffs resulting from extractivism of forest products and uh, products from other ecosystems in Brazil. So this uh, highly contributes to a greater diversity in the human diet here in Brazil. And let me close mentioning the partnership between the environmental uh, sector and the Ministry of Health and the Foundation Oswaldo Cruz in creating a program on biodiversity and health. So Dr. Marcia Shami will really address this program. I'm not going to spend my time with that. And let me close my presentation listing some of the important references. So the presentation will be made available to you. So if it's up to you, you may resort to the important references addressing the interface between biodiversity and human health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Braulio. So quite quickly, I'll turn it over to Professor Eduardo Viola. He's a reti retired professor of the International Relations Department of UNB and senior professor of the Advanced Studies Institute of the University of Sao Paulo and associate uh, researcher for public policies working under the IEA with the University of Sao Paulo. So, uh, Professor, you have the floor. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to speak about the relationship between climate change and planetary health. Well, but my presentation has actually two parts. The first part is the current status of climate change basic and recent data. This is what I'm going to be addressing in part number one. And then addressing directly the uh, many impacts of climate change on human health. And some of them were highlighted by Broglio, by Professor Broglio. Well, the first important matter is that climate change today, for most of the experts, is what we call something related to the existential risk of the humankind. So there is a clear consensus that there are four existential risks. The first is the nuclear war, the most dangerous one. So the humankind is living with this possibility, the extinction of human life in this planet and so on and so forth. So this is an idea from the 50s. So when we reached, you know, the, the nuclear parity between the US and the Soviet Union at the time. So the second most dangerous uh, risk is the existential uh, risk of humankind that is uh, climate change. The third one are the uh, pandemics. Now we don't need to get to 2020 and address COVID-19. It's been many years that the uh, scientists knew this. They have been aware about the risk of the pandemic and existential risk for the humankind, a lethal and contagious uh, virus, nothing to do with the COVID-19, something that would be more severe like MERS and SARS and so on and so forth. And number four is the exponential uncontrolled growth of disruptive technologies. What the disruptive technologies are to artificial intelligence and synthetic biology. 
Well, it's not that the scientists are speaking about something uh, about disruptive technologies and their growth will bring uh, well-being to the humankind. They do, but there is this danger of lack of control because of the exponential uh, growth. And that's something else. And there are other matters in which we do not reach consensus. An existential uh, threat for the humankind, but many other people will disagree. For example, the erosion of biodiversity, as Braulio was speaking about, that would be the fifth existential uh, threat for humankind. And just to give you an idea, in addition to being an existential threat, climate change is one of the global issues of humankind, the most important one, I would say. And then the erosion of biodiversity, because we are in the sixth wave of extinction, the change in the phosphorus and nitrogen cycle, pollution and acidification of oceans, which is increasingly important, you know, knowing about that, there's growing knowledge about that. And the acidification and pollution levels are totally different things. Acidification has to do with the carbon emissions and they are absorbed by the oceans in, in a large share. Pollution has to be with human waste and fundamentally today we have plastics. And then the scarcity of fresh water, the loss of land and soil, including it has to do with the uh, contamination of soils, the depletion of the ozone layer, which is uh, the only one of these global uh, issues in which the uh, collective action of humankind was successful. So we are rebuilding now the ozone layer and also the chemical contamination, the general chemical contamination. So these are the uh, global environmental issues. Now speaking about the climate change and the status of climate change. In 2019, 59.1 gigatons of CO2 equivalent were issued, were emitted. Just to give you an idea, Brazil produces approximately, of course there are variations, but Brazil produces two gigatons of CO2 equivalent. In 2010, in 2019, the emissions increased 1.4% a year, less than 2009, where they grew 2.5. It was the highest growth in history. So it dropped, but far from what science says it's ideal. In, in 2019, that was a terrible year in terms of emissions because there was an intensification of the uh, fires in the forest. So that increased emissions that uh, reached 2.5%. So in an average of 1.4, 2019 was uh, out of the curve. And in 2020, one of the warmest years in history, they, they have been the, the, the latest uh, uh, five years in 2020 is going to be probably the warmest, but uh, until now, the warmest year was 2016, but maybe 2020 is going to be even warmer. But in 2020, there is an estimate decrease of to reduced uh, due to the pandemic, so 7% was uh, the reduction of this year. However, it's interesting to mention and to have to take into consideration that the increase of the temperature of the planet has to do with the historical 
uh, levels of carbon emissions, you know, and of course that with that, the temperature is going to continue increasing because what determines the temperature is the CO2 concentration per millions. I think that at the moment is 416, uh, or something around that uh, last year, but this is not impacted by the emissions of every year. It is an addition, it, it, it piles up, so to say. So uh, we had uh, the emissions of uh, greenhouse gases that were very strong. So. Pasando ao mapa do mundo de emissões. Well, looking at the world map in terms of emissions, what are the main emissions? The in participation and share in the total. China, 31%, and it's been increasing every year. USA, 14%. But it dropped a little bit, but several countries dropped, like China and India and others grow while others drop. So, but it, 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 it's in terms of emissions, like for example, the European Union have been decreasing in absolute terms uh, since the 21st century, century for uh, the European Union and the United States and since 2011. So the European Union is responsible for 9% of the emissions, India 8%, Russia 5%, Japan and Brazil 3%, of course. These are approximate numbers and they are of last year. This year is a different year because it's an exceptional year. Now, the per capita emissions has a different picture. China already has 11 tons per capita, the United States 17 per capita. So in 15 years ago, the difference was huge. So uh, they are getting closer, the United States and China. The EU has 11 for, per capita, uh, India has three per capita. So India still has a low per capita. How, However, the necessary, the, the average uh, necessary for the per capita of humanity would be approximately four tons per capita. So it, for you to understand how difficult the situation is right now. Je Russia has 16 per capita, Japan 13 per capita and Brazil 10 tons per capita. In this current uh, status of emissions, the world is about to surpass the three degrees of temperature. And this is the average, but the average is very different on solid ground and in the oceans. So uh, it, we would approximately surpass four grades uh, if we continue like we are right now. It's more than four degrees is even terrible. In more than two uh, degrees in the oceans, 130 uh, uh, have, uh, was the number given to the carbon emissions in five years. So they are long-term goals, okay? Uh, if we talk about this decade and something within the short term, the only country that is an example is the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom has announced that by 2030, it will reduce its emissions in 68% compared of the, the basic year of 1990. Uh, the United States does not use this uh, way of evaluation. It uses 2005 as a basic year for the study. So it's important to underline that. So the EU 
is always uh, searching for an ambitious goal for 2030. Russia is also looking for an ambitious uh, goal for 2030. But uh, the, for example, we have like in Polonia is the champion, is the, the, the highest uh, uh, promoter of emissions because of the export. But this is a problem of the, the European Union. And another thing that is important is that the level of inequality is very impressive. The data from 2020, if we, it's, it, it came out a, a week ago, the emissions of one of the richest population, the one percent richest population in the world, is twice as much as bigger uh, than those of uh, 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 in poor conditions. So this shows a lot of inequality. And something to highlight here is that the Paris Agreement was a huge victory, but it's substantially a weak agreement because it's not compulsory. So you can add to it or not. And if, if, if each country defined it according to its own interests. So, so uh, we still have a, something to address, which is the Paris Agreement, but it's still weak, you know? Uh, th throughout the world, I cannot criticize it very much, but here I can criticize because you all know what I'm talking about. So, but if we didn't have uh, the Paris Agreement, we wouldn't have anything then. So, so it, it's a beginning, but it's still weak. Something that came out, some news that came out that is very important for this year, for the last two years is the radical change of the behavior of the global corporations in the United States, Canada, Europe, uh, uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, what, what would we call uh, democratic capitalism. These companies are internalizing in an accelerated way the climate risk in their decisions of investment and planning. And this is also happening with all the major investment funds. They are uh, uh, investing less in companies that are not concerned about uh, the impacts of the environment. And another news that came out was the law the decision of Georgia, of the two senators, that is very ambitious. Uh, in addition to the foreign policies, well, the main effect on health, I'm going to go fast because I, I think I, I've already used my time. And I'm going to say that in order of importance. So the deforestation, uh, promotes the, the approximation of human beings. So Claudio has already talked about that. Warmer uh, climate increases the fires in forests throughout the world. There is an impact on health and on the cities. Third, danger of exponential growth of the destruction of the tropical forests, the rainforests. And this is the clearest case, and the case that several scientists mentioned is what uh, they talk about the savanna of the Oriental Amazon. So they talk about 20 to 30 percent of deforestation in the Amazon. So if there were other scientists looking at that that were not Brazilian, they would say more than 40 percent. Fourth, 
uh, warm waves and trot. So uh, the effect uh, in, in summer rains, they affect the human health, especially the elderly children and people who have health uh, conditions. So with warm waves, uh, for example, the elderly in France, I think that in 2004, 2005 in France, uh, they had very bad consequences for the elderly population. I think that they affected 30,000, 40,000, I can't remember how many. And fifth, hurricanes more intense and more frequent, a more turbulence in the social and economic life with impacts on health. So we can see what happened with this hurricane that reached uh, uh, Honduras and El Salvador and Nicaragua. So this, uh, uh, it, is, it is also uh, increasing the number of climate refugees too. Uh, it is different, uh, the, the conditions to adapt to a hurricane like that. If you have so disruption of the cir atmospheric circulation globally, so which is the problem of the polar vortex. The polar vortex is like a belt, like a barrier between the cir atmosphere, the, the circulation of the atmosphere in the North Pole that since that four years ago started to be demolished, provoking very intense cold spells in the temperate zone. And at the same time, that in, that in the polar region, the temperature was 10 degrees or more above the average. So intense cold spells are also part of the climate changes and the climate extreme changes. And also the impacts on agriculture that are already vast and that there will, there will be much even worse, you know? So the change in climate that burns harvests and that then make the population even poorer so because many of them depend on this kind of food chain to feed themselves, to feed their families. So this, this can be a considered uh, a parameter that is uh, the influences of this kind of food in the health of people. Well, this affects much more the poor populations, generates uh, hunger, and more and more refugees. With all that, with all this impact of the climate changes in the food chain and all that, it makes much more decisive for us to act now to improve the quality of the of the human food you know like said like Claudio said there are major farmers and also producers the the for wheat soy uh, corn milk all those kind of food they are produced generally with a lot of agrochemical agrochemicals that is a molecule that is uh, deleterious and that is very bad for your intestine too. Well, all this uh, makes us understand that feeding is, that food is fundamental to make the system more robust. And based on the quality of human nutrition, it's, it's get, getting also poorer and poorer. So if we are 
in a difficult situation, the proportion of organic uh, agriculture and inputs is very low. So we are facing a very difficult situation in this regard, and there's a tendency to aggravate the impact of climate changes on agriculture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Viola. I'm going to pass the floor quickly to Professor Eduardo, Eduardo Miliondo, that is professor of the Engineering School of São Carlos. He's a coordinator of the post-graduation course uh, and works with interdisciplinary uh, topics at USP São Carlos. Can you hear me? Well, I would like to thank for the invitation to Arturo Saraiva and for the organization of this event because it's important for the progress of science. My name is Eduardo Mario Mendiondo. I am professor of the School of Engineering in San Carlos, and I coordinate a center of studies and researches on disasters. That is an interdisciplinary core of the University of Sao Paulo. We have more than 10 units and researchers participating from psychology through all the way through natural science. Uh, and I would like to apologize because I was late for the meeting today because we were analyzing the situation that's happening at, at this moment in the city where I live that was highly impacted by the extreme risks of uh, due to this progressive uh, hydra uh, problems, especially the floods, especially the floods. This is a situation that has been impacting us more and more, the Brazilian municipalities, especially São Carlos. I don't know if you know in, on the screen that I am sharing with you. That is the first part of my presentation. But uh, please just just put it in the the presentation mode. Well, let me see if I can do it. Okay. And I was very happy with the invitation because in what I decided to talk about is how this planetary health can go to... So how can we manage risk since we are in this planet um, that is uh, dynamic, it's not stationary. It's not a stationary situation. It's very much competitive in terms of uh, natural resources. So we may incorporate this interdisciplinary discussion focused on resilience that is focused on the citizenship, on the citizens and the population working with the uh, civil defense and the state of Sao Paulo, the, the national system of civil defense as well, together with the international and federal centers. We do have the Center for Natural Disasters Oversight and Alert. And I was the uh, general coordinator of this center for three years, and we were faced with a situation that is quite similar to the current situation with the COVID-19. So imagine you have uh, 5,560 municipalities, of which 1,000 Brazilian municipalities are chronic, they're vulnerable, they are the group of the highest vulnerability. So imagine every day, 365 days a year, you are always expecting and you are checking on the 1,000 patients. We are talking about more than 70 million inhabitants from all cities of all races and creeds and social brackets. So they are living with this risk of a flood, a landslide, a rainstorm, or again, you know, flood of a river, of a stream, in addition to the scarcity of water, droughts and pollution in such a continental country like Brazil. So CEPED 
is a University of Sao Paulo Center that works from the university, from within the university, with an open perspective in regards to science. So in two years day, in 48 hours, more precisely, we'll be working on the Panta Ray Open Science Colloquium for the Future of Earth, envisioning a post-pandemic resilient society. So that's the website. Uh, it's open for your participation. You may participate uh, in two minutes. You may, you know, submit uh, your information to the event. Of course, we are going to deal with the authorship of your work. And you have to answer two important things. And they are really at the core of the research on disasters and also on the core of the uh, topic of planetary health. What are the uh, science in action examples that we may share so that we have a more resilient society? So the science in action examples. And what are the challenges for us to evolve to a more open, more citizen uh, uh, and more participative and inclusive science practice? So there are many areas of knowledge and I'll give you some examples now on our experiences. Of course, there is a specific approach to the experiences. We do have the SDGs here, but they are split so that we don't need to understand the entire biosphere initially. So then we go to a second level. And then these are the goals that are more connected to the society. And then we address economy and sustainable development. And finally, as was said before, we work with the partnerships. That's the SDG number 17. So that's a slicing that enables us to have the systemic, holistic angle, and that's fundamental for planetary health. For the sake of time, I'm going to move forward. This is water. Water is my area of knowledge. And there are more than 300 water springs in the world of the cities that greatly consume water. And they realized that in the 20th century, they realized that the water springs, they had the issues that were addressed. Increased degradation, increased use of the soil, uh, uncontrolled occupation, and the flows of nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen. Of course, with the sediments, this uh, led to a, a bomb about to explode. So today we have this clear situation. In 100% of the water springs, the key ones of the largest cities in the world, we have an increase from 300 to 1,000% in the costs of operation and maintenance of the uh, water uptake, treatment and storage and distribution of water. I'm talking about fresh water. Well, so this situation will get worse because we have to serve billions of inhabitants. In the Brazilian case, look at that. Brazil has 8.5 um, square kilometers. But if we analyze the 5,560 cities, we can see in the chart, in the center of the slide, we have the number of inhabitants uh, in the X um, axis and the surface, the risk areas on the Y axis. So we have more than 40,000 areas of risk. When we analyze this combination, we see this continental country in which the vulnerability issues that may affect the planetary health are located and focused on two clear elements. It's very much close to the population and these are small areas. So the time to respond in the case of a flood is below two hours. So we have 95% of our frail and susceptible and vulnerable areas in the economic, environmental, social and political arenas. And these are small areas in our continental countries. This means that working with the risks in Brazil and in the case of the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo, much is talked about managing the supply, but we have to manage the demand. We have to reduce the waste. We have to work with our minimal structure indoors, in our homes, in our shops, in our industries. And then at the second level, working in 
redistributing and avoiding waste. And the third level would be working in a policy to protect the water springs. And then everything becomes interesting. The top chart shows how much we can reduce in the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo in terms of water consumption if we do a, a proper water management on the side of demand, not on the side of supply. We are able to reduce by 10 cubic meters per, per second working with the indoor demand. We can also tackle the losses and the waste, which is high. And 2.5 cubic meters per second if we have a comprehensive program on adaptation based on ecosystems. Well, added to that, this results a Cantareira reservoir system, more than 17 cubic meters per second. Well, that's something that we can use for scarcity periods as we had in 2015, for example. And something that is quite interesting is that we know if we know how much that costs, if we can manage the demand, it's less than 2% of the GDP of the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo. Well, 2% of the GDP of the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo managing the demand and the risks that is promoting a conscious consumption consumption, controlled consumption, and properly pricing the water supply, we are able to spare something that is equivalent to the Cantareira reservoir system. So we have a huge potential to work in managing the demand vis-a-vis -vis the population. So we work with the magnitude of the threat. We work with the losses on the other side, but we have two kinds of situations. We have the traditional perspective that is static, not considering the climate change, that is the blue curve. And then we have the situation with the climate change. We can see that the extremes will be more uh, prevalent and then this will result in higher losses. So we don't need to work with the availability to adapt. So from static to dynamic, from stationary to non-stationary, from uh, without climate change, that's the old school engineering that we had in our knowledge, to designing with a perspective of uh, engineering aimed at the long term. If we pro forecast for 100 years, we have the scenarios for the many Brazilian cities based on the uh, millennium ecosystem. So we may forecast how this will subsidize the decisions on public policies to last long. In this case, and you should be following the situation of the floods, we have simple infrastructure for 220,000 inhabitants that cost 700 million reals. São Carlos budget is virtually 1 billion real, reals. If we work with the green infrastructure, revitalizing all of the streams, not doing the water bodies, we go from 700 million to mitigate floods to 10 to 15 billion or 10 to 15 annual budgets to work with the open infrastructure. And then to close, the most remarkable thing is that the infrastructure that is open, it's quite costful for mitigation, for promoting resilience. It's another risk experience. And then we use insurance in that case. We have been developing that this together with the Metropolitan Office of Sao Paulo, but the impacts are different for small municipalities and for larger regions. And this means working with the planetary health perspective based on recycling and cycle of life. So we see a simulation that is done every five minutes for this flood. It's a historical flood that we've had for two years in São Carlos. So we place the human figure in the uh, canal so you can see how it goes down quite quickly in two hours. So knowing how to mitigate floods, adapting, living together. But if we occupy 10% of this uh, water, if we store it, treat it and distribute it in the proper fashion, because we do hold the technology in Brazil and around the world, we could be supplying water 
for non-potable purposes during the three worst drought months in the state of Sao Paulo. We have been increasingly suffering with the drought so we can work with the extreme risks in a cyclical fashion that is reusing, using the life cycle, even considering the extreme situations. Even so, and this uh, pro promotes sometimes a reactionary reaction. Well, that's what I had to say and thank you very much. You have to unmute, you, unmute yourself, Professor. So thank you, Eduardo. That was an excellent presentation. Quite quickly now, I'll turn it over to Professor Marcia Shami. She's the head researcher of the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. And there she coordinates the institutional platform of biodiversity and wild uh, life. Professor Marcia Shami is a researcher from the Museo do Homem Americano Foundation and a member of the Ministry of Health in the National Council on Biodiversity under the Ministry of the Environment. Professor Marsha, good morning, everyone. It's still good morning. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation. I would like to thank Professor Saraiva, and I would like to you know, thank him for addressing the concepts of planetary health that we need so much. So I'm going to be sharing a presentation here with you. And I think it's easier. Just let me know if you can see that. Yeah, just put it in the presentation mode now. Okay, there you go. I'm going to talk about this concept of single health or one health, as the slide says. It emerged from discussions in 1999 between veterinaries and human physicians on the causes and consequences of the emergence of zoonosis, which are diseases that are caused by etiological agents that we share with the animals. And at the time, this uh, concern was very high because of Ebola virus, avian influenza, and many other infections. Posing an alert and telling us that this emergency would be uh, you know, strengthened because of the impact of the use of soil and the transformation of biodiversity. And then in 2004, the Wild Light, the Wild Conservation Society, establishes a conference by the Rockefeller University. And from this conference, we obtain this uh, proposition, One World, One Health, and we call it uh, half in English, half in Portuguese. It's better to define the idea in Portuguese. And at the time, they defined the 12 recommendations with a broad perspective, showing that the human health and the animal health, especially the animals that are produced for human, for the human diet. So this had an important influence on the health of the ecosystems. So these uh, principles were called the Manhattan principles. So this uh, concept encompasses a very extensive number of uh, visions and differentiated disciplines. But over time, it proved to be appropriate and it would be no different because it was, it was born uh, with the support of medicine. And then the uh, Veterinary World Organization supported us as well. So when we analyze uh, the many projects on health in the world, and there are so many, the many international partnerships and regional programs and national programs. So their focus is highly on the um, relationship between uh, food production with animal health and also the uh, possibility of occurrence of zoonosis. And from then on, great importance is given to microbial resistance. Today, it is important for food production. I mean, all of the other diseases that are possible. And also the ecosystem and the health. 
is reduced to a second level in terms of importance. So in 2019, there was this new conference that was organized by Germany and by our society, the Wildlife Conservation Society. And now we have the Berlin principles that updated the Manhattan principles. Drawing your attention to the importance of reconnecting health to the ecosystem within this economic, social, and political framework, and also the issue of climate changes, which was not relevant back then when we devised the Manhattan Principles. We still have this process going on. We still face this challenge correlating the many uh, concepts beyond the human use of the ecosystems and the natural resources and understand what's happening in a larger scale, a process of uh, coexistence. And I believe that the other talks address this very clearly. Just to give you an idea and for us to have a broader angle, some studies and this one from 2015 shows the relationships of the pathogen species that humans share with animals. So uh, one single species uh, amongst many other many others in the country. So we are part of this huge web. That's the web that weaves us and puts us together with the parasites and other microbial agents. We want to have the world as aseptic today, but the parasites, they're important. They bring balance to the ecosystem. They generate uh, individual immunity for many species, including the human one. And it has a role of absorbing and digesting what's in the environment. And we do have relationships with groups that are further away as the amphibes. Well, that's our story, the history of the Homo sapiens that leaves his or her hunter-collector mode, travels around the world, advances with agriculture, consumes plants and animals, and by doing so approximates species, replaces habitats, and all of that can be seen in our diseases today. We have measles. Measles has a great deal of information to us, right? So there are adaptations and mutations of a bovine virus, just like Ascaris. Ascaris is a type of worm of pigs, but it's actually a hum human species that affected the pigs when they were being domesticated. So the story also always has two sides. Is it easy to study that? No, we live in this complex, intricate network of many species, and they are at different stages in their lives. A parasite has many hosts and many vectors, but we also have to study the environmental fluctuations, the stochastic processes, and just genetic aspects and many other things. So recently, to observe recently that in the old studies that already showed this uh, relationships clearly, we see studies from Osvaldo, by Oswaldo Cruz, by Carlos Chaga, and we lost a little bit about that. And now we are studying again the, the history of these diseases. That's why it's so important to understand the ecology of the, the diseases. So we have the in, infections. When we uh, control the worms and peoples, we increase the Giardian uh, protozoa increase. So we have several studies showing that this will lead to a super dispersion of sarcosis that one of the kind of the virus that COVID is included in. And another important thing is uh, that's important to consider is the plasticity of all these organisms. 
that live with us and how this plasticity can show us the way and we can use it in our research as some of these elements as indicators of species that can emerge as a problem in the future. So we have several studies showing that some species are capable of infecting several kinds of different hosts. And so we have this plasticity that uh, some uh, uh, hosts, they, they have a transformation. They go from one species to another. So currently we see this process, we understand this process that is known as spillover, that is a break of this biological barrier when a species is able to re to arrive uh, in a new environment and transfer those parasites to the local species. And the opposite is as true, it's true too. So now, but today we have enough knowledge that is being uh, understood that biodiversity in very well uh, environments with a large diversity of species is this set of species uh, show species that have that have uh, that tend to amplify those parasites while others don't others just kidnap that parasite and they kill it with their um, immunity and this is what decreases the transmission process so this is the a service from biodiversity that we rarely put in our accounts you know and that is important for people to understand that the conservancy units the natural environments when they are well structured they are good to our health and we see that in some examples. This was a work that was published by Zika virus uh, uh, that was found in Africa in the 50s and, and that goes through several different species uh, from the most different groups possible, so alligators, uh, snakes, uh, uh, bovines, uh, and then it uh, until it reaches Brazil in 2015, and it also spreads throughout the world in in wide proportion, in broad proportions. So this viral ha has what we call a reverse uh, uh, transmission in our monkeys. And now we have already news of our of the Zika virus infecting our monkeys in Ceará. And there is a major concern that also COVID-19 can also infect our Sylvestrian uh, 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 animals. So the, in this process of the gain of new species, the virus can have some mutations and can take different paths in which we lose total capacity to be able to track them and to understand and think about uh, forms of control and so forth. So what we see really is that this uh, zoonosis emergency risk really happens with the growth of the population with the uh, if the ecosystems are disturbed and the uh, underlying of intense animals and humans and currently we have uh, techniques of molecular biology that allows us to identify species that in the past we did not have any information about or that we mistake we we used to mistake the species with others so the issue is that the mobility and the circulation of people and products and goods all over the world is something very significant, something very important for pandemic events. Because for example, considering that a person can go from here to France and then to, I don't know, the United States and Brazil within 24 hours. So 
we know that these factors, they favor the emergency of several diseases. We see the Chagas disease in the Amazon. We had projects with acai that uh, uh, made uh, uh, surges of uh, this, the Chagas disease uh, come up just because of the change of the behavior of uh, some animals, the offer of some food products in their in people's homes and, and all that. Currently, uh, current studies show that there is an important relationship between biodiversity of mammals, like we see on the study, and the diversity of microorganisms, that there is a direct correlation between the two. And I think it's pretty obvious, but in fact, here we see Brazil and other tropical and semi-tropical countries, uh, they, uh, they come as a uh, higher focus of zoonotic uh, diseases, you know, so I've been conducting this survey and we don't have a history in Brazil of exporting diseases. It's more like importing diseases, but these factors, these emergency factors are strongly related to the environmental changes and that is why we have now in brazil huge impacts going on especially over the past two years without any perspective of what's going to happen once we know that we have several virus and circulating but uh, uh, very restrict uh, or without any information in Brazil. I bring here this example because I think this is a very significant example because it shows in a system what these relations are about between the environment, he the health and health, the health of people and animals. This is the surge of the Nipah virus in Malaysia that happens after a strong El Nino where huge fires that were intense and that lasted that last long. They produced a dense smoke and may, and caused the reduction of the blooming and fertification of uh, native uh, species. So the so uh, this these animals they went to these fruits. Uh, because it, which was in the beginning only restrict to the bats, uh, was dropped on the floor and also with the, caused the several problems as uh, the damage of the local economy and things like that. So it's a complex pro process. It's a complex problem. It's not restrict. It's not local localized, but it's a very huge problem. And the question that remains is for us in health as a whole, what is the impact that the fires and that deforestation in the Amazon and Pantanal will bring to people? and we already have this impact on people with the increase of cardiovascular diseases, intoxication, neoplasies, and also we are seeing uh, increased cases of uh, um, other cases that are transmitted by the bats in the areas that was not that were caused by them in the case of rabies. The rabies transmitted to human beings by the bats. So I'm going to show you an initiative by Fiocruz for this main challenge, which is to monitor the emergency of zoonosis in Brazil uh, coming from Sylvestrian animals. Considering the extension of Brazil and the diversity of ecosystem, the distances, the vulnerability of the population, the differences 
between the cities and the municipalities in the way they behave towards health and all that. We created uh, a system of uh, a health system based on citizen science, where we believe that any person can take a picture with their cell phone of a sick animal and send it to us so that this information can generate data and this data identified will automatically generate alerts. This uh, uh, abnormal alerts will be distributed to the health system so that they can go visit the place and see what's happening, collect some biological material so that this biological material reaches a laboratory that can have a good diagnosis. And based on this diagnosis and the relationship between the environmental and ecologic factors of that place where this occurred, we can have some interpretation on that. The system is very simple and it's free. It works offline without a ship, a, a, a chip. It's been tested in Bahia, in Caatinga, in very in several random places. On the web, we have the Center of uh, Sylvester Information and to support the multiplication of the system to professors. We have technical material to help us as health agents, and but also uh, reminding you that we, on the map, we get into the system. So we also have this guideline that it states that biodiversity is good to your health, teaching people how they can along their lives, along with all the different ecosystems, be healthier, live in a healthier environment, and so forth. I'm going to show you how the system has been working with yellow fever, that I think that it's been very effective and very didactical to overcome the complexity of dealing with the public health and planetary health. So yellow fever, uh, the first information that we have is that it arrived here in 1685, coming with uh, it is aegypti, the mosquito, a vector that came out from out of Brazil with a virus, and that it is capable of infecting several kinds of mosquitoes and all, all, all species of monkeys that we have in Brazil. And what we notice is that the monkeys are the first to die. So in the area where the virus circulates, we find dead, monkeys before people get sick. So monkeys are our best soldiers, you know, to uh, detect yellow fever in Brazil. Then the, the, uh, if we find any register of mon dead monkeys, it generates an automatic alert in real time and sends the information to the manager at the central level to the Ministry of Health in Brasilia and the state uh, managers. This alert goes uh, in the form of an email and the person receives the picture of these animals. And this is very important because it enables the local health systems to identify uh, the animals and they can have a biological collect, they can, go there and collect biological material. Be and if you do that with a decomposed animal, it's not feasible. So we, we, gain, we have some gains in terms of time. Then in a joint effort with, with the Ministry of Health, a few crews in several states, Paraná, Santa Catarina, Rio, Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo uh, worked to identify the surge of yellow fever. Uh, the aisles where the where yellow fever goes through, and now we know that it uses the monkeys and the information from people, from health agents, agents we can confirm these aisles. And we know that the transmission 
advances 100 kilometers in every 30 days on average. And so with that, we were able to limit the areas for vaccination happening at different times, different periods uh, in a very smooth way so that we were able to step forward and to advance ourselves to the death of people in Santa Catarina. We had only 19 people who died and because they refused to, to get vaccinated. Of course, the monkeys continue dying. So this is the model that we're working with now for 2020, the, for a random forest, random forest here in the Southeastern region. We already have occurrences in Brasilia with positive animals in these 10 municipalities under attention. See where we have the, uh, the cases in Goiânia. So yellow fever is not in the forest areas, but it's also in small fragments too, showing that. And this is something we've been working on to show that the forest fragmentation increases speed of the spread. Here we see a large fragment that is structure. And when it's structure, uh, the speed of contamination decreases. The speed also slows down. So I think that by doing that, we're going to control this in Brazil. What I had to share with you was this. I would like to thank you the opportunity for this presentation. And if you want, we can discuss a little bit more. Now I'm going to go quickly through the questions that we have, uh, the questions that were already asked. We don't have time for more questions, I believe. We already have four questions. So the first is directed to Professor Viola. The question is the CO2 annual per capita for uh, CO2 can obscure the historical per capita. They are two different measures. The current per capita, the historical per capita, you have a huge debate from to base on when. From the point of view of United Nations, the per capita starts in 1990. That's why 1990 is the basic year, the base year for the Kyoto Protocol. Then you have other uh, possible historical per capita. The uh, one would start in 1960 where you have data, broad data about the emissions, both in, as well as um, deforestation as well. The emissions of uh, nitrous oxide and methane. And finally, and this was addressed uh, for Brazil, but there was no support whatsoever. That is going back to 1800, 1850. But then there is an issue about that. These are just estimates of the energy emissions. Well, the deforestation emissions are not included because if we were to include the deforestation emissions in Brazil, it would be very high because it began in the 19th century with the Araucaria forest and the Atlantic forest as well, deforestation. So that's a very important principle in terms of international relations. If you, in the relationship between countries, if you point fingers, if you blame the generations, I mean, the current generation for something that was done by previous generations, when the uh, climate change issue wasn't here, it wasn't there, by the end of the 70s, the key questions of the climate experts was the new glacial era, when will it be? So uh, the knowledge on global warming 
came afterwards. And it became clear to the scientific world in the uh, Hamburg Climate Conference in 1978. And then we really approved the idea that we were facing a global warming and there would be no ice age. Of, co of course, it can happen in the future, in a remote future. So when we blame the previous generations, I mean, the current generations, for the behavior of the previous generations, we then establish the uh, condition, conditions for a perpetual conflict, including war. This is very clear when we study the map of the territories. Imagine if you would like to go to prior and prior maps. Imagine what Europe would be if the borders could be rediscussed today. Germany, let's say, would uh, cover a great share of Poland or Leningrad. That's Russia today. Even if you go back 70 years before today, imagine if you go much further. So these are two different measures. In my opinion, what is fundamental is measuring the accumulated emissions, the historical emissions since 1990. That should be the base year. Very well. The second question for everyone. COVID-19, because of its complex nature, it has emerging uh, properties in terms of mobilities. The question is, the global environmental changes, do they have emerging new properties as well? Or is it actually a factor related to the social environmental fabric? And what would be the key uh, processes related to the uh, emission of greenhouse gases that have to be understood for us to overcome today's scenario? To, who is the, to whom is the question? To everyone. So one of you can answer. We don't have much time so that everyone can answer all the questions, you know. Very well. Eduardo Mediondo. Well, I showed a graph showing the magnitude of the event, of the event and the uh, economic impact. So the, these curves are changing all around the world. One of the impacts that has not been assessed in terms of its rarity, it's progressive, it's not probabilistic. It is the consumption of natural resources, especially the water consumption. So it's a non-stationary process. And in this non-stationary process with the COVID in the state of Sao Paulo, and we made a study, it's going to be published, there is an increase in the consumption use of water, the consumption of water in some sector, and quite a significant increase in some municipalities. It means that working with the long-term changes, such as the climate change associated to disturbances, episodic disturbances, like one or two years of pandemic, that should be an area of knowledge to be further broadened, you know, studied by social sciences, environmental sciences, psychology, because most likely this will provide a new perspective for the decision makers, especially in the municipalities. And especially in Brazil, we have the sanitation framework. So there is a new arrangement of public um, and private partnerships. Well, this one goes to Professor Viola, I think. Do you believe that the pressure of the financial markets and the large corporations that have been adopting sustainable economic policies, do you think those could have the power to avoid a collapse point of the deforestation of the Amazon in the short run or the pressure of the agribusiness and the demand from the polluting markets is stronger. Well, here goes, that's more or less like this. 
The uh, changes in investment, internalizing the environmental and climate risk by the multinational corporations from the uh, democratic world. Well, of course, this has quite a strong impact. It serves as a counter pressure to deforestation in the Amazon. But we are now under this administration. And the changes that we saw in the companies in the last two or three years and their decisive moment was the Davos uh, Forum in 2020. So all of the key risks were environmental risks, climate and so on and so forth. Of course, the nuclear war was there as well. But the risks, they were all environmental. So the Davos Forum was a bit blind about the pandemic because it had begun in China by then and also because the WHO took a long while to declare a pandemic. Well, but this pressure exists. It does exist, but there is an issue. We have two markets in the Brazilian agribusiness and something else that is important. The Brazilian agribusiness has two sectors. Well, a sector that internalized the climate risk it is the exporting, the more modern sector that we have here. So they internalized the environmental risk, but not the risk to human health in the Brazilian production method that uses, you know, pesticides and glyphosates and hormone, hormones and antibiotics in the case of animals. So they have not internalized such risks, but they have internalized the climate risk by a large share of the sector, most of the sector, they do not depend upon on the uh, deforestation today or increased yield. They do not depend on the uh, deforestation in the Amazon. They depend uh, in the uh, deforestation in the uh, savanna. So the world is looking into the savanna and the Amazon, of course, that's what the world is paying attention to. And these uh, corporations, um, they are aware of the uh, climate change and they account for part of the demand of the Brazilian agribusiness. I would say the European demand on the Brazilian agribusiness. However, the main exports of Brazil are directed to Asia and the Middle East. Well, with the except of the Japanese and the Korean market, these markets, specifically the Chinese market, because we are right there in the Eastern world, their key concern, it's not the climate change. That's why I spoke about the Western global multinationals, the democratic capitalism. For them, the key factor is food security. And this basically explains the extraordinary growth of the Brazilian exports the agribusiness exports to China during this year, because China is promoting a transition uh, from raising, you know, backyard pigs to raising, uh, you know, more modern farms of pigs because of the swine pest that destroyed 60% of their pig herd. So the imports of animal protein is gigantic because of that. So at this point in time, they create some sort of confusion layer on the dangers of the agribusiness, the Brazilian agribusiness can have in the future because China is also internalizing, becoming to, pardon, starting to internalize the climate risk. So there is room for not changing the Brazilian status, the Brazilian situation. So we've had, you know, huge deforestation in 2019 and 2020, but there was no impact whatsoever on the Brazilian exports. Well, there's some impact to a certain extent to the European exports, more specifically related to meats, but not regarding soybean, for example, regarding uh, meat, because yes, the European market is super demanding in terms of the use of hormones and antibiotics and pesticides. Professor Marsha 
Would you like to add on to that question? I think it's worth thinking about that when we talk about coronavirus. Only now has the virus caused all this process. We have been selecting pathogen species with this high transmissibility level person to person. And this has really to do with our behavior. It's important to see ourselves in the ecological place that we are in the planet. An animal with a high geographical distribution that is active 24 hours a day that eat just about anything. So many of us live in vulnerability situations in spaces without sanitation, with no proper uh, sanitation conditions to have a good quality of life. And we have a biomass that is considerable. So our species today is the perfect target for any other species of microorganism. Well, if we are to think about vectors, if there's a vector that requires blood to fulfill its biological cycle, definitely this vector will resort to the human species because that's the species that offers the largest amount of food of nutrients. So we are this generalistic species. And when we see ourselves like this in this planet, we really start to think about different ways of producing and different ways of dealing with the industries, with our plannings. I think this perspective is fundamental. Today, we exercise this gigantic force so that the uh, species can evolve quickly. Well, the virus will change in 24 hours and our generations last 80 years. So the race after antibiotics, this race is uh, never ending. We can only stop it if we balance the processes. So we do have to think about the complexities, especially in regards to the production arrangements that we have, thinking onwards. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. This is the final question that goes to Professor Eduardo, Eduardo Mario Ediondo. Well, do you know any city hall or any agency that has implemented, you know, the policy to control demand, as you mentioned? And if yes, what were the results? Thank you for the question. Well, I want to take care of my health to live and to really see a city hall administration doing that. What we witness in Brazil, and unfortunately, we see more vocational examples of some European city administrations, especially European. So every year there is an European mayor from an European uh, city. We had Copenhagen and Amsterdam, and they joined this vocational undertaking. But it's not fully implemented. Europe has the target of 2030. But unfortunately, we cannot find a, you know, a city hall here in Brazil. So we have a menu of consumption linked to the water footprint, but it's highly deregulated. And the mayors are aware of that. So the chancellor in Germany, she, she's a scientist. She has a major in sciences. So as a chancellor, she has this view that is respected, but the German cities, they are not fully resilient. They are not fully sustainable or neutralizing at zero their water and ecological footprints. So they have not yet tried to surf this wave. It is a digital wave, it's, but it's not a consumption wave. It's a decision-making wave, actually because they were not able to control yet the virtual uh, consumption of water. So unfortunately today, there is no municipality in the world that can self-declare itself as the zero or neutral footprint. And in the next 20 years, we can see some good examples. 
I believe the example is, is going to be in a very small scale, very small municipalities with fewer inhabitants. So economically, they can implement uh, the restructuring, but the large ones, they will go to large agreements. They will pay some sort of fee or tariff, environmental fee to be able to offset their footprint because they're lagging behind, way behind. So that's a thinking that we see in some countries like Canada, for example, because when you exceed a certain uh, rupture point, hardly ever, hardly ever can you do reverse re-engineering and start from scratch and reverse the situation. So I wish I could live, you know, 20 years longer to see a small city hall, you know, declaring itself as neutral, uh, with a neutral footprint. I wish I could live that. So very well, and with this question, we close this panel, and we also close our activities of the morning session. We are running a little bit late. We resume the works at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. A better year to everyone. Happy New Year. Let's hope for a better New Year. Thank you for those who are watching us. Presentations will be available on the IEA website and the links for the YouTube broadcasting will be at our webpage. Uh, planetaryhealth.iea.usp.br. Stay healthy. Thank you. Obrigado. Tudo de bom. Obrigado. Boas festas. Vacina para todos. <laughs> Vacina para todos. Vale. Sem Vacina dúvida. Vacina para todos. Parabéns. <laughs> Parabéns. Obrigado, obrigado. Parabéns pela apresentação também. Vamos lá almoçar rapidinho.